everybody, Patrick Connor here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. It's boxing history time, man. Boxing history means I'm here with my dude, Aris Pina, copy box operator, but more importantly, a lover of fight history like myself, Aris. How are you, my friend? Doing pretty good, my man. How's everything on your end? You know, it's hot. Hot like everywhere, man, but... Very hot over here, too, man. We're hitting 90 degrees again. So for all those people that have been out there claiming and yelling about summer being over and last week's and nothing, trust me, it's, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. That is not the case. But we got some hot boxing discussion today, man. Ooh, <laughs> you know, I ooh. mean, it's, it's, uh, we're going to be going over a lot of stuff that's fun and like, you know, history, easy to talk about because it uh, involves a number of familiar characters and stuff like that. But unfortunately, like a number of the boxing history episodes we've done lately, it is, it is somewhat poignant, somewhat sad too, because the ending is just not a fun one. Nonetheless, no, it's it's a good discussion, and it's stuff that I think a lot of people are unfamiliar with. So that's why it's worth a listen, especially about a fighter who's been forgotten over the years, and if anything, how he's remembered, it's just because of how badly he got his ass kicked in the biggest fight of his career. But there's a reason why I'm wearing my New York Knicks jersey today. Anthony Mason, in fact, rest in peace. Because um, we're talking about one of my favorite um, eras of from back then. And you know what I mean? We're talking about New York City. We're talking about the 80s. Mason played in the 90s, but it's irrelevant. Um, just, yeah, my two favorite things to talk about. So, you know, I'm going to be cooking on this. But when, nonetheless, we're talking about Davey Moore, the former junior middleweight champion. Um, a member, just a lot of layers to his story here. You know what I mean? Grew up in the South Bronx. Um, a member of NBC's Tomorrow's Champions, which was an ill-fated group that I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, how he became a world champion so soon the fight that happened with Duran, a lot of the plus, a lot of things that happened before that fight that a lot of people may not realize. Um, a lot of things with this story. And of course, you know, like we said, the tragic ending, but Davey Moore is one of those guys that again, he's been forgotten over the years. And if he's remembered, it's because of what Duran did to him that fateful night in 1983 at Madison Square Garden. And, um, but these, there was much more to it. You know what I mean? Like more, was a multi-time New York Golden Gloves champion. He was this close to making the 1980 Olympic team that obviously never made it to Moscow. Um, he was one of the first world, he was one of the first fighters that, you know, before having a dozen fights, become a world champion because of the inflammation of championships and what was going on during that time period. He was a part of that first wave. There's a lot of things to talk about here, Pat, and it's a very fascinating story, very interesting story, even if it doesn't have the best ending, but that's why we had to talk about it today. Right. And I mean, it's, it's not just the happy stuff that we remember. That's the kind of, that's the, it's, it's easy to remember a lot of the happy stories. And sometimes it's more difficult to remember the stuff that's icky or, you know, just tragic. I mean, look, there's a lot of highs with this story and there's a lot of lows. I mean, it's just, there are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on top of that, we also do get amusement out of just kind of recalling the history of it too. Not the bad stuff. We're not like, Oh, you know, fist pumping to the icky stuff, but it just, the uh, just remembering it is, you know, fun for us. And one of the unfortunate things just in terms of the internet searching for this is that a number of years earlier, another fighter named Davey Moore, if you look up like Davey Moore plus boxing or something like that, you're going to come, uh, you're probably going to come across a lot of, the other, the other Davey Moore was, I believe, a lightweight and who, what's that? Featherweight champion. Thank you. Yeah. Featherweight, uh, who passed away a number of years earlier after a fight. And so there's just tons of, tons of stories about that one. And that will kind of well, that hinder. Was, I mean, usually even you and Google it. That was the famous Bob Dylan song, Who Killed Davey Moore? Yep. That's right. Yeah. And it was a fairly high profile. Like it's, it's mostly forgotten now, but at the time very high profile oh it um, was magic it was, it was really it really was magic. you know the I'm, I'm not to go off course really quick but that was sugar ramos who um mm -hmm. well, more in that fight and the way in it i believe it was they said more when he dropped his head snapped off the bottom rope and that's like it jacked up his um his brain stem right yeah so, and sugar ramos if i'm not mistaken was the fighter who actually had earlier in his career also right. Yeah, another fighter had actually died after a fight, uh, tragically, earlier in his career. And and the, as you, I'm sure, could imagine, again, not to get too off course here, but the, it destroyed him. And he wound up turning to alcohol, I believe. But again. I know, man. I ended up meeting him at the Hall of Fame my second year there. And he would do, to say he was happy to be inducted, 
would, would be an understatement. Everyone, like, I think me and um, my best friend, we went there and we met him and he was like, you know, gave us like a bunk, like major hugs and he was all bopping around and stuff. So good for him. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And I mean, on the uh, obviously, apart from the tragedy of it, the unfortunate thing is that that's going to hinder a lot of the searching that you might do. So just look up like Davey Moore plus junior middleweight or something like that. And you're probably going to come across a lot more stuff. Um, there are a couple of, of resources too that like, you know, just like the last couple shows, I like to make sure people know that we're not just uh, that we are kind of like standing on the backs of giants or whatever to do the research. It's not all us that we've done the work or whatever. Um, but Carlos Acevedo, he did uh, a couple of pieces, one for Boxing News on Duran Moore. And he also, in the, his book, Sporting Blood, wrote a bit about Davey Moore too. Uh, it's a, a number about a number of fighters with tragic endings. And it's and whatnot. a really, really, really in-depth article. I mean, that one like really breaks it down as good as it's going to get. Yeah, and especially in a condensed format. And and also, he's just a really good writer, so it's worth getting for that alone. Um, and he's from the Bronx, I believe, isn't he? So he actually has, like, you know... Like, I know he's, like, he's from New York. I don't know where in New York, but I believe so, yeah. So, so he's it. definitely got that connection, too. There's a couple of really good uh, Sports Illustrated articles and a couple of good New York Times articles, too, that kind of fill in some gaps. But nonetheless, it's all got to be put together. It's all got to be kind of packaged just right. So that's, you know, and that's why we're here. That's what we're trying to do. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, right. Apparently, Davey Moore grew up in the Morrisania neighborhood of the Bronx, which, as I understand it, you would know more than I do, is not a good area. It's apparently, you know, by, by all accounts, of, or at least at, at this time, was not a good area. So it's the quintessential or stereotypical kind of growing up in a bad place. Even Davey Moore's mom, his own mom, Lee Moore, said that he grew up in, quote, the real ghetto. And that's something that Carlos quotes uh, in, 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 I think, both places. And I mean, it's kind of like, you know, years after the fact, if your own mom's saying like, yeah, he grew up fucked up. It's kind of like, <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no holding back there. So he obviously came from, from a, a rough place, you know? Look, New York City is always, was always. I mean, like the the way New York is today, it's a lot different even from the New York I moved to in two thousand seven. But the New York City of the sixties into the seventies um, was, you know, it's hard to describe how bad and how crazy it really was. All right, um, <clears throat> I have a book right here I can show you called um, Bronx Boys which was narrated by a guy named Stephen Shames, who was a, um, a photographer, who originally was supposed to be on assignment for, the ma for this magazine that actually went completely under his first day on assignment for this project. But the first day that he was on assignment for this project, this was literally the very first photo he took, some kid jumping from roof to roof, which of um, is Joe Cortez style, if you read his info back in the day. Anyways, um, as bad as New York City was back in then, South Bronx was like ground zero. It was like as bad as literally you can like imagine. You know, just death, destruction, blight, you know, the blown out um, apartments, buildings everywhere. Everything was just like really, really bad. And it was, you know, if you grew up tough and you didn't have a lot of money or anything else going on with you, you're just going to become another statistic probably. That's what Mora really had to go through and try to get through. And that was tough, man. Most people weren't able to get out of places like that. And as, as, I, as you said throughout that article, Mora's mom said that, you know, Davey was passed around from family, from different family members, right? Because his mom really couldn't, you know, take care of him on her own that way. So Mora had a really, really rough upbringing, but to his credit, he really never really got too much in trouble or anything. It, it seemed like she didn't even know where, yeah. where he was, like, or who he was being passed, you know, through or to, um, because she had to work. And she had, and she just wasn't at home or wasn't able to watch after him, I guess. And so he was more or less left to wander the streets, fend for himself. And somehow, and she even said herself that she fairly often had to send him to school with no food in his belly, that he had to go to school on an empty stomach. And so he was apparently allowed to just wander the streets. And despite that, he managed to keep an A average in school. He participated in karate, track, handful of other sports, um, and he was consistently a good student 
obviously a very intelligent, also just an intelligent person, a well-spoken guy, uh, just a talented individual. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, despite the fact that he's growing up in this environment, and I mean, I, I, I'm i always wary of like kind of telling these kinds of tales because they're so fucking stereotypical. You know what I mean? Like, and I just, I don't want to just like tell this like, oh, you know, he's growing up in an urban jungle type of shit. But it, it is the case here. He's growing up in a really awful environment, despite the fact that he's growing up in an awful environment, it excels, does well, you know, is able to whatever you want to call it, rise above it. And, you know, academically, athletically, as a person, seems like he's doing very well. And when he's 15 years old, he walks into the Morrisania Rec Center and he tells the guy who's running it, Leon Washington, that he's going to be a champion. He's going to be champion of the gym. That is not world champion, but champion of the gym. I mean, it wasn't that much fucking longer about world champion, but uh, champion of the gym within a year. And Leon Washington said that instead of taking a year, it took him about three months and that he was beating up all the older fighters, like the older kids in the gym within a few months. Um, <clears throat> as far as Leon Washington goes, some quick background on this guy. Leon Washington, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, I'm kind of back and forth about him because he's definitely a character in this story for sure. Tells a lot of stories though. And I'm kind of like, when people tell a lot of stories and a lot of them seem un, like not believable, that usually means they're not telling the truth to me. And obviously there are people who have lived lives that we know for sure that is the truth. And that shit is fucking unbelievable. We know, you know, that is, that happens, but it's, it's rare. And some of the stories that he told were just kind of like, mm. but in any case, <clears throat> he was a pro fighter. And he said that he turned or Leon Washington, that is, and that he turned uh, himself into a pro fighter because he kept getting into street fights and fucking everybody up. And that at some point he messed these dudes up and that like a week later, they came back to the same bar with 10 people and that he basically beat everybody up except for a couple of guys and wound up being sent to the hospital, but that somebody saw the fight and said, Hey, you should get into pro fighting. And so he did. And then he turned into a pro fighter and he did indeed turn into a pro fighter. He wound up having like an 11 and six record or something like that. I'd have to look again. But uh, but he was a pro fighter and he did have a, a decent record, but he told all these kind of like tall tales about these fights that he had about like fighting Rodrigo Valdez and like knocking him down and they were carrying Valdez back to the corner and they stopped the fight and, and you know, Valdez uh, were basically to help him out because he's the local guy and they couldn't allow Leon Washington to beat Rodrigo Valdez over here, you know, this type of stuff. So it was like. We know for sure these kinds of stories are happening, but absent video, it's tough to believe. Uh, so sure no one had Rodrigo Valdez just laid out, splayed out, being carried out of the ring, Apollo Creed style. All right, please. It, it, yeah, it's it's a little, it's, it's kind of a tall tale. Like I said, an absent video, it's tough to believe. And then on top of that, there's like no, no corroboration. And then again, like I said, for years and years and years, the guy was telling a lot of stories. So point being, uh, he, this is the guy who at the end of his toward the end of his pro career, by the time he ended his pro career, he already had been running the Morrisania rec center and, and uh, coaching all the amateurs that were in the Morrisania rec center. And you can see his name uh, in a number of the amateur tournaments as the coach for the rec center in newspapers and stuff like that for amateur tournaments before that. So he was the coach there for, for a little while. In any case, like I said, a bit of a character in the story. Um, and that was the guy, though, who handled Davey Moore's career, both as a trainer and a manager. And even Leon Washington said, he was like, I never expected to be a manager. Like, I never trained to be a manager. I don't know anything about managing. And I've only trained like amateurs or whatever. It's just that according to him, when he saw Davey Moore, he knew, like he knew that this is a talented kid. This is somebody I need to really push and to, you know, whatever. And, but that also, uh, that mindset from Leon Washington also wound up being like, I don't know if you want to call it foreshadowing or whatever, but just wound up being part of what brought about Davey Moore's demise because Leon Washington saw that talent and his inexperience led to him pushing for every opportunity that was thrown their way. Like they, he just didn't say no to, you know, anytime, you know, Davey Moore has got an opportunity. They were like, let's go. 
And so there's obviously something to be said for that. It's admirable. It's, you know, you'd like to see that from a fighter or whatever, but sometimes that's, you know, that leads to trouble. Absolutely. And Mora had a, like you said, man, not only was he academically great and he did a lot of success in school and not only did he do it with, uh, with different sports, but in terms of boxing, man, he was hot shot quickly. He had a great amateur career, four time New York golden gloves champion, which back then can't tell you. I mean, still, even today, that's extremely tough to do. Like New York golden gloves compared to like, I don't know, say like other parts of the country or whatever. There's a lot of prestige that comes with being a New York, you know, New York city golden gloves championship, you know, different boroughs that comes in the different, all kinds of things that go in there like that. And before, you know, up until recently, now the finals, I believe are held in the Barclay center, if not somewhere else, but for many years, obviously decades and decades, the finals were always held in MSG. And imagine, you know, fighting to a face. sellout, to, to a, a sellout. sellout. Yes. Like this was big news. This was a big, big deal. You know what I mean? A lot of bragging rights on the line, a lot of things on the line, a lot of, form, you know, future world champions came, you know, with former New York Golden Gloves champions, a lot of legends in the sport. And um, <clears throat> Davey Moore in the, in the early, in the late seventies, in the mid seventies, the one he was tearing it up over there, man, it was, that's a lot of accolades that comes with a lot, a lot of credentials, you know, and the respect he garnered in that time in the mid, in the late seventies, after the 76 Olympics, when you're looking for that next crop of talent, more is over, you know, he's one of those guys that's like a heading, um, ahead of the pack. 100% dude, you said the magic word, 76 Olympics We've talked about it recently and yeah. how much of a driving force that was in the U S the success of the 1976 Olympic team Boston was at its absolute peak of popularity. It was incredible. It, it was not just the success of the team, but the fact that it created superstars Yeah. because Ray Leonard yeah. obviously was the quickest. He wasn't the quickest to win the title, but he was the quickest to, you know, really take off. Totally. Um, you know, Leon Spinks also to some degree, but just not as much like Ray Leonard was the star, but that the ability for the 76 Olympics to create the stars that quickly like that and to garner so much interest meant that there was a massive surge in amateur boxing, especially in an area like New York, where that already had a history of pro and amateur boxing, a big scene that was just re you know ready made, even to this day, as broken as the amateur scene is New York still has an amateur boxing scene, you know, like you mentioned earlier, other cities like Chicago used to have a massive golden glove. So Philadelphia did for a while, even New Jersey, New Jersey had a fucking golden gloves that was doing really well for a while. It was sponsored by a newspaper. Massachusetts is another one too, where you have to fight yeah. all from boroughs and other, because it's New England. So they encompass like even different states. Oh yeah, there's a like crosstown rivalries. Oh fucking... yeah, it's, it's not fun. Like, yeah, like, bro. He was breaking it down for me recently too. He was like, you want to win the New England Golden Gloves. You got to win not only this, you have to go over this. And like, you know, guys from Connecticut and this, like, well, they have the Connecticut Golden Gloves, but like, you know, other part, like it's, it's a lot that that's, you know, almost like the New York City ones. It's a lot to encompass. A lot of different layers you got to go through to get to the right. final. So what Davey Mora was able to accomplish back then, man, was very, very significant. And it brought him to the pack where, to the point where he was able to make it to the 1980 Olympic trials. And even though that team was ill-fated because of what was going on and, you know, uh, the Olympics was going to take place in Moscow that year, or USA ended up boycotting it because of Jimmy Carter or what was going on in the world. But um, Moore ends up fighting Donald Curry in the, in the finals of the trials. And Curry himself had one of the most ridiculous amateur records you can ever see on par with like Lomachenko. I can't think of the exact number off the top of my head, but it's <laughs> the same thing. Like one of those, you know, similar to like a Breland or something. Yeah. It, it's, it's a ridiculous record. So like for a guy like Davey Moore to lose the, to, to Donald Curry in the finals is clearly like, you know, no shame in that Moore clearly, you know, showed himself that he's has a lot of potential he has a bright future ahead of him and a lot of promoters are going to want to eat him up. You know what I mean? Just sign him quickly if they can. So he becomes a part of what we're going to bring up next. He becomes a part of this group called tomorrow's champions, which was featured on NBC. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's right. Yeah. They're um, when it comes to the golden gloves thing, like, I mean, it, this is on his box rec page, but it was also at the, uh, at the time it was, <coughs> excuse me. 
<laughs> it, I think it was a record setting at the time when he had won four consecutive Golden Gloves. Um, and since then, a handful of fighters have done it. But in any case, whatever the timeline, he's in pretty rarefied company. Howard Davis Jr., fantastic amateur, you know, ridiculous amateur who unfortunately didn't wind up living up to his potential as a professional, but later on wound up becoming a fantastic uh, trainer and, you know, all around great guy who died tragically. Alex, Alex Ramos, Bomber Ramos, who also was a really good amateur didn't quite quite live up to potential as a pro either. Mark Breland, same, you know, same, same, same. A extremely ridiculous amateur, didn't live up to pro potential, but did have a good pro career anyway. And Riddick Bo, same, same, same. <laughs> didn't live up to his pro potential, but nonetheless won the heavyweight championship. Don't want to downplay that. But that's that's a pretty well, elite they company. The potential of these guys that were that they were supposed to reach too. That's how good they were. You know. What but I mean? yeah, but that's the point. Like, is that's a that's Breland really was being exalted to company. Henry Robinson before he turned pro, like after he won the Olympics and when he was turning pro, like people were making comparisons because they always loved to compare to them. Like Shane Mosley was compared yeah. to Sugar Robinson before his first world title fight with Philip Holiday. Like. They always live up to these crazy, un, you know, expectations or they're supposed to live up to them. And then they un, end up unraveling for one reason or another. They still, like you said, have great careers, varying degrees. But for whatever reason, you know, everyone's just like, oh, man, they didn't live up to expectation. Well, look how lofty the expectations you left for them. I don't care how great they look. You want them to be the next Sugar Robinson. Right. It is, it's, <laughs> it's not exactly any sort of shame to not live up to expectations when the expectations are way the fuck up there. You know what I mean? They still had a highly respectable careers, um, you know, to varying degrees, of course. But yeah. but um, yeah, like the the amateur careers and stuff like that, it's also important to remember when it comes to the records, a lot of those are self-reported and there's almost no way to verify all of them. But even so, like we're we're able to clearly see that these fighters had stellar amateur careers. Um, and all the while, this entire time, well, not the entire time, but toward the end of his amateur career, I should say, Davey Moore was actually attending Manhattan Community College for a, a business administration degree, and he transferred to Manhattan College, and he actually wound up taking a leave of absence from Manhattan College to fight. Right on his career. Yep, which is the opposite of what our boy Fidel LaBarba did, who, you know, who quit at quit as flyweight champion to go to Stanford. And all of his professors asked him, what the hell were you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> How he took a class. <laughs> yeah. And, and still, despite that, he came back uh, a while later, but had an incredible career. But nonetheless, right. you know, uh, Moore is taking a leave of absence. Like you said, he signs with top rank under this kind of almost packaged uh, set of fighters. It's Alex Ramos, who I was just talking about, Tony Ayala Jr., Tony Tucker, Johnny Bumpus, and Mitch Green. Those are tomorrow's champions who were considered like Olympic hopefuls for the 1980 James Olympics. James Broad was a part of that group too, wasn't he? What's that? James Broad was a part of that group too, I believe. I'm not sure. I didn't see him listed in like the tomorrow's champions like NBC package thing, but he might have been. I, well, in the one, I'm, I don't know what article it was, but one of them they listed, he was, he was one of the guys they talked about um, as like one of the <laughs> That's one funny. Of the, but he did have like a stellar amateur career too around that point that he was supposed to be, I believe he was going to be the member of the Olympic team as the super heavyweight because he knocked out Marvis Frazier. Big boy. And in fact, not, not only did he knock out Marvis Frazier, gave him, he was the one that gave him the damage with the spinal damage from hitting him so hard. But um, that was a, that was a total great class right there. And you list those name of fighters, even when you hear the name Mitch Green. You know, when you think of Mitch Green, people are like, what, the, the guy that Tyson beat up and the, the maniac that used to, you know, because Mick Treen's a character, you know what I mean? Like, he's funny to laugh at, like, all his videos, but if you're not familiar with Mitch Green, aside from the Tyson theatrics, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. All that, and, uh, but, but, you know, the photos that are recent, that have surfaced over the years Michelle now. Michelle Cicely Tyson. Yeah, and the photos <laughs> that have been surfaced over the years now of Mitch Green being, you know, dropped by Tyson, first shaking his hand. Then you see them confronting each other. And then you see Mitch Green on the ground and Tyson <laughs> over him. Um, Mitch Green was actually a very, very talented amateur and a very talented fighter himself. He showed a lot of promise. And at the beginning of his career, it looked like he was on the hot track to a top contendership, if not for a world title. So, yeah. yeah that was it's just total coincidence that he looked like Rick James. 
I mean, that and that, like, you know, he was bad, probably dabbling as much as Rick James was in the same substances in the mid 80s to have him acting like that. But most when he likely, turned, turned pro, before the Jerry Curls came and he actually had an afro and everything, no, nah, Mitch Green was pretty talented. He was. And, yeah. um, and, and these fighters were all considered kind of like cheated out of their opportunity to totally. participate in the 1980 Olympics. And so there was some pretty decent money invested into these fighters. Uh, almost all of them were on uh, covers of boxing magazines, either the Ring or KO at one time or another, and featured fairly heavily too. Um, and like and like you said, it, they were kind of as a package, or, or, or as a and the the idea of tomorrow's champion sold to NBC by top rank. Um, and so Moore got a lot of attention early on in his career, both as an amateur. And as an early pro, as a member of kind of like this, uh, this class or whatever. And so like fairly early on in his career, I mean, he didn't take on anybody, uh, you know, when you look good, just go to box rec and look on, you know, look at his career and you're going to be like, oh, I don't really recognize anybody until you get to Kevin Rooney. Right. Cause everybody knows, knows who Kevin Rooney was at this point. However, uh, the guy he fought right before Kevin Rooney, Joseph uh, Mbuga, that mm -hmm. dude was a, um, I want to say Ugandan guy who like wound up moving to By the, the way, Netherlands or something. What's that? Did he fight? He, I know he, he fought Duran. He, he yeah. just fought Duran. And so that was kind of like part of the idea of fast tracking Davey Moore or where, how quickly that had come because he had fought Duran not long before that. And so despite the fact that he got stopped by Duran, according to uh, top rank and according to Davey Moore's handlers, they felt that Duran looked like shit in that fight and that this dude was able to give him some trouble. So they, you know, they did the whole thing where they're like, all right, well, let's see how we can do against him. And they wound up TKOing him in one round. And it was like, whoa, you know, where we did better than Duran, you know what I'm saying? And so uh, then they got in. With well, yeah, it's always Rooney. used throughout the history of boxing, isn't it? And it's it it really it really came fairly quickly. And I mean, fair enough because you look at his early pro record, and he didn't even fight in any. He didn't even fight anybody with a losing record until no, no, a few no, fights was, after that. You can, I mean, clearly, well, top rank has always been known for like good matchmaking all throughout the years, even in the eighties and the you know the early days from the seventies and eighties they've always had solid matchmakers for them. So clearly Moore, who, like we said, was a very decorated amateur. He was, I don't think he was ready. He clearly didn't even know he was being fast-tracked this quickly because no one, I think, expected this as we're about to get to. But he was being built up as a decorated amateur would be, a guy that clearly had a lot of experience, knew what he was doing in the ring, and there was no need to put him in with a bunch of pasties who he wasn't going to learn anything from. So even though the guys he's fighting now are not world beaters, at the same time, these are guys that, for their experience, they were supposed to give more rounds, which they did, and they're supposed to give him some experience, which Moore was getting from that. But he was also looking good in the interim while doing this. So, like you said, these guys are being featured on NBC. Often Bobby Chez was obvious. I remember, because you've seen video clips of him being featured on ESPN in its very early days, as well as the networks. Tony Aiello was being featured all the time because he had, you know, just his rampaging style and backstory. All these guys were being featured because, like you said, you know, they felt like they they lost their chance at winning potential gold and doing great things in Moscow. So now this was their chance to like, you know, since boxing was still extremely popular as well, this was their chance to bring them to the audience and for everybody to get to know them. And people were getting to know them. And more too, we had to mention this as well, man. He was very charismatic. You know what I mean? He was a good looking guy. He came from New York. He had a great smile beautiful white teeth and everything like that. Like he was easy to relate to and easy to, and very easy and very likable. So with all that being said, like we just said, I don't think he realized how quickly he was going to go to a world title because eight fights into his career still was most guys are just getting ready to fight. And, you know, mm -hmm. at this point now for more, maybe for like a regional title or something. No, nah. Bob Aram gave him a phone call to say, get ready. You're going to Japan. Yeah. You know, he had, um, he had, so quickly kind of shot to that status right like um man i i clicked away from it because i i i'm not able to totally memorize all of this right like i can memorize some of it but i can't memorize all of it but um basically what had happened was um 
uh, Tadashi Mihara wound up beating Rocky Frotto for the WBA junior middleweight title. And that was in and of itself kind of a shock verdict. And so we talked in the last couple episodes about the split between the WBC and the WBA in the 1970s and the fact that that was also kind of along promotional lines, right? Don King was friends with Don Jose Suleiman. And so he wound up getting a lot of like kind of preferential treatment with the WBC and getting cozying up with the WBC in terms of champions, his fighters, rankings, et cetera. I mean, some people might hear that and be like, wow, that's a lot of fucking accusations. It happened. Trust me. And so when it, but uh, Don King and Bob Arum, of course, at this time too, and we'll get into this even more in just a minute when we get to the next fight. Uh, but Don King and Bob Arum were at odds pretty good at this time. <clears throat> it makes sense that they would be. They had both tried to uh, promote some of the biggest heavyweight title fights around this time. And also, both had rose to had had to risen to prominence right around this time promoting big time heavyweight title fights and both of them had gotten into a little bit of trouble right around this time too or at least trouble in terms of public perception right so um basically the w uh, in co by contrast top rank and bob arum had kind of cozied up to the wba instead of the WBC, the IBF was still kind of like emerging. It hadn't really, you know, made its way to the forefront yet. So in any case, uh, Rocky Frado, when he lost to Mihara, top rank kind of like, I, it seems to me as if they, they saw an in, they saw a way to kind of, you know, get hold of that, you know, that championship, that belt. And so in any case, the opportunity for Davey Moore to face Mihara came up. And according to Leon Washington, again, I, I don't know, we're going to get to this, his stories more in a second here too. According to Leon Washington, he said that he felt top rank was not sending them to Japan to win that fight and that they were not going to win that fight or didn't feel like they were being brought in to win that fight, which sounds curious because you'd think, like I said, that top rank would want control of that belt rather than having it, you know, be with Mahara, they'd rather it be with Davey Moore, right? Like that, totally. right? Like, am I wrong? But it, it just sounds like a weird accusation from Leon well, Washington to me. The reason why that sounds really curious is because of the whole reason why Davey Moore even got a title shot in the first place. And the reason why that was is because Bob Arum was still trying to do dealings in South Africa at this point. You know, the whole thing that was going on back then from like, we've discussed this before on the whole podcast we did on um, Sun City, South Africa, back in the early 80s, um, back in the early 80s. We, yeah, we were kids when we did a podcast, um, <laughs> you know, a while back. Podcast when we did, pioneers. Yeah, when we, did, um, when we did a podcast on Sun City, South Africa, they were, I guess you can kind of, you know, if you want, you can kind of compare it to what, how Saudi Arabia is today, you know what I mean? One was the locale that has a lot of money, very controversial, a lot of willing you know, to pay up the wazoo yes. to get high, high, or uh, you know, high, Basically, high, well, yeah, upper level, high stakes, whatever fights exactly. in their country. Exactly. So, but the difference is with Saudi Arabia, they don't. It's not like they're trying to push any of the. They have any fighters they're trying to push as world champions and bring a big fight to their country for that. They're just picking up high level fights. South Africa back in the 80s with Sun City specifically, which was this exotic location, which not only were they dabbling in boxing, they were bringing in a lot of different entertainers and singers at the time that were getting tons of scrutiny also for going over there. If, you know, when they found out, but they were just I'll like, never yeah, forget they, that fucking song. Yeah, I just I always hear it in my head every time we talk about it. The, you know, the the song they made that was like the world was, aid type yeah, of yeah. I, I ain't gonna play Sun City. Totally. Miles Davis was interviewed about it and he would talk about it and he was like, you know, he says, South Africa makes me ill. It hurts my bones when I think about that place and what they're doing over there. Um, Sugar Ray Leonard famously, you know, wearing, wearing the candy, uh, candy cane colored trunks in his rematch with Tommy Hearns. He had a mandala, a mandala, you know, um, across the, the thing. Um, so there you go. You know what I mean? Um, and it's like, so anyways, Aaron though was, Back then, there was, like you said, they were throwing tons of money and they had heavyweights that they were trying to work with. First off was Cali Nutsi, who, um, controversial, got a cop, 
um, linked with apartheid, you know, um, major controversy when he came to America to fight Bill Sharkey because of what he did in terms of shooting um, a black youth in South Africa and all this other stuff, like really, really bad. It wasn't even, yeah, it wasn't even, a, yeah, it wasn't even allowed to, yeah, there was a big controversy about him even being allowed to come to the U S at all. Totally. And he ends up fighting in Miami beach in a fight. He ends up stopping Sharky, but it was just a big fiasco. So anyways, Aaron was trying to work with that. Originally, John Tate goes over there, knocks him out. After that, he fights Harry Kosia in South Africa. Same thing. Tate beats him. Um, Aaron, probably was hoping Kotsia would have won that fight to make more money for that. But regardless, he still made some money out of that, even though Tate beat the beat, you know, two of their favorite sons. Fast forward a couple of years later, Aram now has interest in a very, very popular fighter in South Africa, a junior midweight by the name of Charlie Weir. Charlie Weir, very good fighter himself, man. Very exciting style, good looking guy. And what made him distinct was his nickname was White Lightning. And the reason why he had a very distinct, you know, uh, nickname like that was because he had a white stri- um, streak of hair going right down the middle of his head. You know what I mean? Besides all the black around it. So the guy was extremely popular. After Coach Sia was like, you know, kind of on the wayside a little bit. And um, he was like a national hero to the white South Africans. Yes, huge, huge. And he was very high in the rankings, specifically in the WBA. You know, he was right there and ready to be taken. So... Aram saw business to be done and he wanted to work with that. Mihara, though, being um, a Japanese, you know, being from Japan, the Japanese commission was a part of the rest of the, you know, world and being conscious enough to be like, we don't want to deal with South Africa and we're not going to go with this. So Aram that needed to find a loophole. In comes Davy Moore. I hope I explained that well enough without like going off rambling too much. No, dude. I, th- I mean, there's, there's a lot to the South Africa story. So I mean, like, but it's... I mean, like, but basically, but basically that's how Moore gets into it because yeah. he can't use me Howard directly to go to South Africa to fight weird because that's not going to happen. The commission won't let him do that. And Aaron's like, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh, here's more. Moore has eight fights. I'm sure I can like finagle something to get him into the ratings. It's not a big deal. Whatever. We can send him there. Yep. Well, and and to be more specific, and this is according to Leon Washington, according to Leon Washington, and I mean, I guess there's a reason to listen to him, whether or not you want to believe him is up to you. But he said that as Davey Moore's manager, that in order to get that uh, title shot against Mihara, they had to agree to fight Charlie Weir in South Africa within a certain time period. And I mean, it kind of it kind of checks like out 90 days. And it checks out because it was under that time period. So, and so sure enough, he goes, uh, you know, he goes to Japan and he defeats Mihara by six round KO. And then, and, you know, I mean, and according to him too, uh, according to Washington, they had, you know, a, a decent enough time in Japan, but then like, he felt like they were fairly rushed and whatnot into this South Africa, into the South Africa deal. But like, you know, Charlie Weir brings a lot of money in South Africa. Uh, and, and on top of that, they fought somewhat controversially in Johannesburg too, not even in Sun City. So Johannesburg uh, is very divided off into factions by, you know, just like a lot of cities are, a lot of big cities in certain places of the world are today where you can almost see like other, some people might've seen like memes or photos on social media or stuff like that, where you see like these massive fields of like shanties and shacks. And then like right next to it is like this lush tennis court or some shit like that. That's precisely what this looked like because the white people in Johannesburg or parts of Johannesburg had these like mansions and fucking property and fields. I mean like, you know, nice fields and gardens and shit like that. And then there's these literal slums you know, just across the way, where basically, if you're, you know, any darker than fucking peach colored, you got to go live in the slum. And you and it's enforced, you know, by force, by violence. And so there's a lot of hesitation, like you said, the the kind of national fear and international fear about any sort of participation with South Africa at all, whether it's sports, highly controversial in Johannesburg itself, you know, it it was perhaps seen as a way to dodge the Sun City controversy, but just, you know, it, it was not helpful at all. So, um, but nonetheless, Charlie, we go ahead. To, to add to your point, so you were just saying like the differences of like how South like with Johannesburg and other parts of South Africa, look up um, 
a book I had since I've had since I was a kid. Um, it's called Lifetimes Under Apartheid. From by if you if anyone's ever curious about like seeing the complete differences, it was a photographer by the name of David Goldblatt who uh, passed away relatively recently. But um, he covered everything from Johannesburg to Soweto to Boxburg, which was like the really affluent, like rich yep. part of South Africa. And That's where Kotze was there. from, yeah. And everything in between. And it's a really fascinating book because it's like mixed with like poems by um, a lady by the name of Nadine Gordimer. But um, it's really, really interesting stuff. But you, can, you can get the whole spectrum of what really went down yep. during the time period. So Soweto is where just countless great fighters from South yeah. Africa have uh, come from, not just Soweto, but that's a notable area. Totally. Um, I just wanted to add that. Sorry to. No, dude, let's add the context where we can, you know, like, because it might just be easier for people to get it here than to go listen to other shit or watch it, you know, first. But uh, back to Charlie Weir, again, kind of a national hero for specifically white South Africans who, and, um, you know, again, just to kind of, like you mentioned the Saudi Arabia thing. Um, you know, we've seen this recently with Saudi Arabia. We've seen it with United Arab Emirates. We've seen it with Russia, kind of that sports washing deal. But we also have to kind of remember when it came to South Africa, there was a whole other element of it. It was an element when it came to the white South Africans of racial superiority, specifically, yeah. you know, like yeah. it, it, it totally. Yeah, there was uh, this, there was a portion of it that came with racism that made it different from these other situations. That's not to say these other situations are okay, because there's not as much racism or something. But this specifically in South Africa was it was highly flammable, you know, when it came to the situation. Um, and so a black American, a black American who's young black American who doesn't have a lot of experience being brought in against a much more experienced Charlie Weir, who is the white national hero type of guy, also a very, a very skilled fighter, and is thought of as somebody who, you know, if not should be favored, but at least given the situation, you know, he's fighting at home, uh, given the controversy. Uh, and on top of that, a very hostile crowd of like something like 45 or 50,000 people. And this was all set up for him. And when you really think about it again, because like Aaron was trying to get, because by all, by, if when you think about it, Mihara was going to be brought to South Africa if he was allowed to go to lose the weir. And that's the entire was- promotion, apart from top ranks, at least from what it looks like minor involvement, was yeah. all a South African promotion. Exactly. So that's what everything was supposed to be coronation for weir, but more to his credit was able to upset the Alpha car. And it was a big upset at the time. Because even as a kid, when I read about it in a magazine, they said that Mora was not brought in there to win. You know, like you said, everything was made up for Weir to win this fight. He had the more experience. He was a national treasure in South Africa. Mora was there as a transitional champion. Sometimes, like, if you want to call it that wrestling, there would be a guy like, um, for like in the 90s, when Bob Backlund, the former longtime champion of the 70s, but I got to bring this up. You know what I mean? It's some kind of comparison here. (laughs) When Backlund in the 90s came back, he beats Bret Hart, which was a head scratcher for me as a kid. But like only a month or two later, ends up getting splashed and powerbombed by Diesel and MSG in 30 seconds. And then Diesel becomes a long-term champion. That was supposed to be like Moore. Moore was supposed to be the guy, okay, if he's able to, at least beat Mihara in Japan. Because even though he's only 8-0, Mihara was limited enough that it should have been well, you know, Moore had enough experience that he should be able to handle him, which he was able to. But then he was going to go to South Africa. Right. That was supposed to be, you know, okay, now he's going to lose this. And now the, we have an, our champion that we want. Right. And, and, and I think that even from, from like a promotional or whatever standpoint, uh, and I'm not trying to put like, you know, words in top ranks mouth or whatever, but I could imagine them thinking going in or believing going in like, hey, dude, look, even if Davey Moore loses against Weir, we already, so then we can get uh, a handle of this promotional money in South Africa and capitalize off of the controversy and still have a viable young, young guy in Davey Moore. He might not be champion again, or he might not be champion right now, but we could probably guide him back again. They were talking about uh, fairly early in his career. Uh, Leon Washington's talking about how Davey Moore uh, could take on, Ray Leonard at some point, you know, because Ray Leonard's super hot at this at, at this time in 1982, and he's a big star. So, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, that's getting big for their britches, but that's that's what he's talking about. So, um, yeah, I think top rank from their perspective is like, 
whatever, you know, he's like nine and O or something. Like if he loses this, he's nine and one. So what, you know, we can guide him back to a title. Not, not a problem. Uh And instead that's not what happened at all. I, you know, it, it, instead, man, you know, it used to be on YouTube, all right, because I've watched it before, man, but more whoops his ass. Like, it was not a fight that anyone expected was going to happen like that, because like we said, we're... Yeah, he chopped him up. Yeah, we wasn't the type of fighter that, like, he was a built-up, just, like, you know, pasty commodity with an inflated record. He could actually fight, all right? There was reason why Aaron wouldn't just go into an inflated record type guy. Like, if he knew he could make money with someone who actually who had legit skills and knew what he was doing, he was going to go all in on it. And we're, aside from his popularity, he could really, really flat out fight. And it looked like there was, you know, it would have been an easy coronation. But no, man, Moore, who was a very, like, Moore's style was like, when you look at him and you see his build and you see the way he's, like, lanky and everything, you wouldn't expect the way he fought how to be his exact style. But, because you would think he'd be more of a boxer or so, but he wasn't. You know what I mean? He kind of fought out of a semi-crouch and... He was a very, very aggressive. He was a volume puncher who just came right at you. And he didn't really worry so much about defense because his offense was more overwhelming for it. So he would sacrifice taking a few punches as long as he was able to overpower you. And he had relatively fast hands. He had good power in his fist. He wasn't a one-punch knockout power guy, but solid enough that he can get your respect quickly. And he was physically, he was strong too. So, I mean, and he he's had a, a good, game. like, workhorse fighter. You know, like, he doesn't Very do anything, like, fighter, super yeah. excellent, but he's just good at pretty much everything. And if you weren't able to hold him off, and he had good stamina, too, he was able, you know, to go on the long run with that. So, if you weren't able to hold him off, chances are he was going to run over you. And that's exactly what happened to Weir, because Weir had a similar style to him, too, but I don't think he experienced anything the way Moore came at him. Moore was an animal that night. And, like I said, I haven't watched it in a long time. The last time I saw it on YouTube was years ago, but more just thumped him like a basketball man like you know watching pete maverick doing like that like dribbling tricks was kind of like what Moore did to him that night just absolutely just boom 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 boom. and poor charlie weir i mean he god bless him he really tried hard that night and he's a tough guy that dude was some dave brubick right on his head dude just Just straight up bro just he just got thumped everywhere (laughs) you know what i mean and it was such an impressive performance that even though Moore now was at 10-0, and 0, people were just like, holy shit, this is the future. Like, he's – a lot of people were very high on him. Um, Steve yeah. Farmer in particular was high on him. He knew Moore had a really fast amateur career, and the way he just dominated Weir and what was going on, people started taking notice. They were like, holy shit, all right, this – he might be very legit now because Weir was looked – again, left for the last time, Weir was looked upon as a guy that was going to be maybe the future of the division, and Moore thrashed him, so – well, the guy who just turned 10 and 0, Moore was in the best place he could possibly be. It, that just, it's just something that didn't happen very often. You know, we recently brought up um, Pete Rodemaker against Floyd Patterson, you know, Rodemaker fighting for the heavyweight championship in his pro debut. That's obviously, you know, and, and if, you, never up either. It, if you go back far enough, if you go back far enough, that happened a number of different times, you know, with, uh, some unknown motherfucker fighting for the heavyweight championship, like the bare knuckle heavyweight championship. You never, you know, nobody ever heard of this fucking guy, but somewhere off in Alabama, they said he kicked somebody's ass. So he gets a shot at the heavyweight title in 1871 or, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you go back far enough and you can find these things, but the point is in, in this actual era, it's pretty rare for a fighter to get a shot at any sort of world title with that few, with, you know, that few amount of fights and then for them to actually win too because it's you know it's normal to have a number of different fights before you're actually challenging for a world title well now like you know you get to like start getting to like 17 18 and oh they're just like all right so when are you get into a world title and it's like pump the fucking brakes dude and let these yeah, people fight in the early 80s man guys back then were still had to get like 20 something fights before they right. even fought an abf title yeah that's well, and that was well, normal Normal. Think of someone like I'm. For, I don't mean to cut you off, but think of someone like from the from the A's, like Dwight Davidson and Curtis Parker, who ended up fighting each other, both undefeated for I think it was like the NABF or USBA in crowd, and both of them had like multi like high twenties in their fights before they fought each other, and that was considered a high level fight. Right. Today, that would be like people would be looking at them for a unification or something like that. You know what I mean? Well, and that's and that's one of the things that I had complained about for I mean, and it's not unique to premier boxing champions, but something we see, we have seen with them not as much lately, but have seen with them. But again, with other promotions too, 
it's just easy to kind of cherry pick because of how big welterweight was for a few years. Um, but when like two contenders fight each other, like just contenders in a division, because neither of them is the consensus consensus champion, and it's like a fucking Super Bowl. And it's like, dude, this is it's just two contenders fighting. We don't even know if I, either of them is the best fighter in the division. And so, but the point being that like those, the things that we would see on Showbox or whatever, you know, two undefeated prospects or some shit fighting like that, that was a regular occurrence in other eras because it had to be. And so, and then, but even so, even under those circumstances, a fighter like Davey Moore winning a, a world title in that short amount of time, very rare. But then on top of that, and I kind of suspect that doing that, that not only defeating Mihara, but then going on to defend against Weir and do it in style. So, I mean, there was a little bit of a story that Leon Washington told, according to him, again, <laughs> I, you know what? I just got to read this. Like, I'm not going to, I can't yeah, man, go this. for it because these Leon Washington read it. stories you were telling me earlier are hysterical. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a, I'll let you guys be the fucking judge here, right? <clears throat> the hand. Yeah, shit. The hand flicked through the van's open window and slapped Davy Moore, who had just defended his title by knocking out Charlie Weir, Charlie Weir, the white hero of Johannesburg. I don't think they knew it was Davy, said Leon Washington, the former boxer who managed Moore. They were just frustrated seeing their hero lose to a black guy, and they were causing trouble. Leon Washington then proceeded to cause a little trouble of his own. He had been criticized by some fellow black Americans for taking his fighter to the country of apartheid, but he was not going to be criticized for letting his fighter be slapped in the face. I don't know how I got out of the back seat. My wife was even sitting on my lap, Washington recalled yesterday, while waiting for tonight's more Roberto Duran fight as Madison, in Madison Square Garden, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I got out of the van and started chasing one of them. Leon Washington is... I think it says 40 years old and nine years past his last professional fight. People often tell him he could have been a middleweight champion with the right manager, the right trainer, the right time and the right play. I mean, that's literally any human being, whatever, <laughs> but okay. The night of April, blah, blah, blah. It was time for stand up for the only fighter he ever managed in South Africa. They're not used to black guys hitting back in public. Washington said, but I'm not a South African. I chased the guy and knocked him out. My wife was shouting at me to get back in the car and there was nothing more to it except that I broke my hand from hitting the guy and I popped my knee right out from stopping too fast when I caught up with him. All right, Bob Sheridan. <laughs> and then I was driving my sports car and flipped out of it and shot him with an Uzi. No. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it was such a, I don't know how to kill, but yeah. I'm a trained oh. assassin. No, look, uh, it, and when I was telling you this story, I mean, this is again, like this is kind of like I was saying with the amateur record, self-reported. So who knows who who knows how much of it was true? But all I'm saying is that in Johannesburg in the early 1980s, it sounds really unlikely that a black dude would be chasing down a white guy in the middle of the street and then beating him up and then getting away like you know nobody says said any, says anything does anything. I mean, I'm, if that is true, that's great, and I'm happy that that happened that way. I'm just saying it sounds really unlikely. I'm just saying, and, considering also, too, that Moore just beat up their national hero, I don't think that just, you know, tensions would be relatively high. Right. <laughs> right. It, yeah, and it, it sounds like if somebody is ready to reach into a car and hit somebody, that it would have popped off more than, ah, he's running after me, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Nah, something's just not adding up there. Yeah. <laughs> but, in, but in any case, it was definitely quite the story. Uh, and also, I think that it kind of adds to the idea that, in my opinion, it seems as though uh, Leon Washington and Moore were probably feeling themselves a little bit. They were probably, you know, feeling their oats, feeling confident after those two particular wins, because especially because before any of this, Leon Washington had said to newspapers that they that there was one fighter in particular that they thought had a style that they wanted to avoid, and that was Ayub Kalule that Ayub Kalule was looked like he was just going to be a really difficult fighter to fight and that they didn't want to have to fight him, you know, unless, unless they had to, they weren't going to fight him. Mm -hmm. And so sure enough, three months later, they fight Ayub Kalule. So, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I didn't look up the circumstances as far as like rankings or mandatories. Maybe they were forced to fight him. 
And if that were the case, that would actually kind of fit the narrative a little bit because, you know, it was like this entire time they keep kind of feeding them to the wolves a little bit. Like they're just like, okay, so you can withstand this. Let's ratchet it up a notch and see if you can take this. And sure enough, you know, he, he gets in with Ayub Kalule and TKOs him in 10 rounds. And that was the fight that everybody like solidified more in terms of being like, all right, this guy might be a future superstar. And if not that, then at least a legit champion because Kaluli at that point, his only loss was to Sugar Ray Leonard. All right. And no shame in that. Like he gave Leonard a hell of a fight to win that one. And Kaluli was. That was uh, the in-between fight where people were like, what the fuck are you doing? This is not an in-between fight, you know? Totally, totally. And Leonard was one of the first people. Like Whitaker ended up doing that two years later. You know what I mean? When he ended up fighting a guy like, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, Vasquez. You know, yeah, I mean, Julio uh, Cesar Vasquez. Yeah. Julio Cesar Vasquez. And you just can't, people are like, wait, what? You're just going up just to fight him and move, you know, similar to that thing. But like Leonard was a badass. Kalule was a champion. Um, same came up around the same time, uh, a little bit before John Mugabe, but just an absolute badass and became junior middleweight champion in the late 70s up until the early 80s. But like, not really known in America, but just, you know, really had good credentials, man. You know what I mean? Like a very good boxer, a good fighter, was known as being really physically strong, even though he didn't have one punch knockout power. And he had a style too that just, like you said, it wasn't going to work well with anybody. Leonard for, just because he had great balls himself, man, was a guy that loved to take challenges and not just kind of look for a pasty he can go for before fighting the biggest fight of his life, took on a clue Like you said, people were just kind of like, shit, bro, really? Um, okay. You know, and Leonard was still instilled as a favorite because of his reputation and what he had accomplished already. But people, a lot of insiders were thinking to themselves, yo, I think he fucked up on this one. But instead, you know, Leonard put on a great performance. As good as Kalule did, he wasn't embarrassed as all, though. You know what I mean? Like, he put on a good performance in that fight. And Leonard wasn't that, hmm? And it wasn't that the one, too, where before the fight, there was, like, they were top rank and shit, where they were doing all sorts of, like, weird shit and, like, Ray Leonard like brought in like some witch doctor or something like that. And Ayub Kalule was like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Like, I'm from a big city. Like, what are you, what the fuck are you talking about? I have to look that up. I'm not, I'm really almost, sure. I'm really? almost positive that like they, was fucked up. Well, you know, I hate when they, they, they did something weird like that. And he was like, what the fuck is this shit? But then on top of that, well, he still wound up winning really? and yeah, taking yeah. his, <laughs> still wound up winning and taking his title. So it was like, ouch. God damn, talk about rubbing salt on the wound, bro. <laughs> so anyways, though, Kalule was at that point, though, like you said, man, for a guy like Moore, who had only had about 10 pro fights at this point, fighting a former world champion has only lost to the Sugar Ray Leonard. He's, 40 and, he's only 40 and one, and he's still at the top of his game. Um, that was a big risk. A lot of people were thinking to themselves, okay, you know, Moore beat Charlie Weir. Now people are thinking maybe Weir wasn't going to live up to his expectations, and he was just, you know, a flash in the pan or whatever it is. But Kalule was already experienced. He was a veteran. He went rounds with Leonard. He put a lot of hands on Leonard before losing. And he was respected. And he was still a very, you know, a top in the division. And a lot of people thought, okay, maybe now more a bit off a little bit more than he can chew. Especially with his style, too, because like you said, with his style, that was going to fit into Kalule's hands. But more to his credit, and this is another fight I haven't watched in a minute, but man, he, again, the attrition that he puts on, bro, you can't beat a guy that just keeps on churning and churning and churning. And Mora was just, you know, he, he put it on that night. You know what I mean? He put on a very good performance. It was probably the best performance of his career, if not the Weir fight. The one, because that was the one, this, this was the fight that really earned the respect of everybody in boxing. Not just, you know, like fans that were surprised that he knocked out Weir, but like all the skeptics, all the veteran writers, the other veteran fans, whatever you want to call it. This was the one that people like, all right, you know what? He beat Kalule. This is big. I got to respect him for this. Yeah, it, and I mean, like, that's it, this is not like you know, a Hall of Fame run type of shit. We're not trying to, no, no, but that, I mean, but for a guy with such few, respectable. With such few fights, a guy that's only had 10 pro fights and you're over here beating someone like that's what I'm saying. Like, that's respectable, like, dude. You're looking, if you want to put this comparably, um, you're gonna look at someone you can honestly, you can look at someone like Floyd Mayweather, Fernando Vargas when they were on their runs early on, when Mayweather was beating someone like Hernaro Hernandez, Gennaro Hernandez, or when, um, Vargas was beating someone like Yuri Boy Compass. You know what I mean? And they had more fights than Moore did at this point. That's true, yeah. So yeah. especially Campus, because Campus had like a shitload of fights by then. Totally. And Vargas, I think, had what, like 16 pro fights or so when he fought, when he ended up fighting Compass. 
And Mayweather was what, 17 or 18, you know, when he ended up fighting, I don't know the exact number, but when he ended up fighting Hernandez. I mean, in tremendous accomplishments in themselves, but I'm just trying to give you a comparison how fast Trot, how fast, um, how fast forward in Moore's career was at this point. Because mm-hmm. it's one thing beating Mahara and even Charlie Weir, but when you're knocking out Ali Ayub Kayu, Kalule, ugh, Ayub Kalule, um, and you're only 11 and 0, 10 and 0, that's big. And, and on top of that, it, this wasn't some grand plan, dude. A lot of this was like fly by night, improvised shit. Totally. Like they no they one were doing what they had. Over and they're just kind of like, well, we have this hot commodity on our hands. What are we going to do? And, and so, I mean, you kind of have to understand that in context too, that yeah, he was getting fed to the wolves and that, that somebody, I suppose, does have to answer for that. But at the same time, it was, it was almost kind of like, well, what the fuck would you have done? I mean, you would have done the same. You would have pressed your advantage. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, but I mean, think of, I'm sorry, but you got to think of the time ahead. period as well. Right. Because mm-hmm. in, the, in this day and time, if a, if a fighter like Wilder, for example, even though he had a bunch of fights when he finally won his belt, or if like another fighter, for example, like wins a world title after only a handful of fights now, when they end up defending their belts, they're still being matchmaked to the point before they have to fight a mandatory that it's almost like they're still being built up as a pro. You know what I mean? Yep. They don't, they're not really they're still developed. Yeah. They're still, they're still being developed. And in the eighties, especially the early eighties and the era that Mora came up, that wasn't going to happen. If you became a world champion, you were going to get fed to the wolves. And, and no just to, to and just to kind of illustrate too, what you were talking about the far the the development nowadays and stuff like that as far as pros go a lot of that is conditioning a lot of that is conditioning them to be able to go four then six then eight yes, and ten totally, and twelve totally, rounds totally. and if you look at Davy Moore's career he goes one two three four five six fights where he goes six he doesn't he skipped four rounders entirely he didn't even do any four rounders he had six six rounders two eight rounders and then immediately the 15 round fight with Tadashi Mahara. So, I mean, like, yeah, there was no titrating. There was no like, you know, leveling up, you know, like that. It just, he went from fucking eight to 15 and that in and of itself is extremely impressive because nobody's going 15 rounds these days anyway. But, but so, you know, this progression was so fast and it was really remarkable. The, what kind of hurt though, I, I couldn't tell you what specifically happened in this time period. I would imagine that there probably was a little bit of overconfidence, but that's just my guess. I don't know for sure. But I will tell you that just mathematically, you know, going over the fucking math, in the 11 months between Ayub Kalule fight and the Roberto Duran fight, Davey Moore fought only once. And he fought a dude named Gary Gieden or Gieden. And the one of the reasons why that fight happened, or one of the you know things that kind of pushed for that fight, is that Gary Green had had fought and defeated Sean Mannion right before that. Sean Mannion was a really popular dude in the Northeast, you know, in Massachusetts, and had been on. I want to say, I, I think it was NBC, but wherever he was on, you I'm know, he, for the vacant belt too. Yep. And he was a he was a fairly popular regional, but popular fighter and a fairly popular TV dude. And so uh, Guiden had defeated Sean Mannion right before this and had gotten that shot at the WBA junior middleweight title with Davey Moore. And Davey Moore, you know, cleaned his clock you know, pretty good. I mean, with all due respect to Gary Guiden, he just wasn't really on that level. And neither was Sean Mannion for that matter. But it was just a it was just a matter of popularity. That's all. So that kind of propelled him to that. But in any case, uh, you know, the very quickly came the opportunity to fight Roberto Duran. And there's like an entire story behind that, too, which touches on what you were just talking about. So this whole time period too, the post 1976 Olympics, but then stepping into the era of the quote unquote four kings. Right. You know, you get Hearns, Duran, Leonard, Hagler. And all four of these guys in and around from welterweight up to middleweight, everybody wants a shot at one of these fighters because they know that they bring the money, they command the money and they have the promotional deals and shit. But there was obviously a question about Roberto Duran for, you know, obvious fucking reasons here after the Leonard rematch. I mean, there's an entire oral history behind the no mas and all that type of shit. A lot of people to this day contend that he never even actually said the words no mas and that it's this big weird story that people have latched onto. 
who knows but it stuck with them it's stuck it's stuck with them even to now it was a it was a massive uh you know stain or shame on roberto duran's career for a long time he didn't even fight for whatever it was like nine months or something like that and was in a deep depression he wound up uh ray arcel fucking split on him carlos eleta his manager who had managed him since the beginning of his career split on him um you know and duran was just they a lot of people considered him a different kind of fighter and a different kind of guy you know they didn't know if he was going to be able to come back from that at all and then on top of that, going into, let's see, you know, real quick looking, 1982 loses to Benitez. A lot of people thought Benitez soundly outboxed him. I thought it was a pretty close fight, but, you know, Benitez should have won and did. So then people were again kind of like, oh, you know, here's Duran losing again, you know, as a fucking loser. And then again, loses to Kirkland Lang in the upset of the year in 1982. And he was written off entirely, you know, written off pretty much altogether. And, you know, by the time he had come back from that, it was like an entire rebuild. That's, that's what people had considered it, even top rank. So uh, he split with Don King by this time. Don King, I would imagine, didn't really want to have much to do with him because he was so inconsistent. You, know, you lose to Kirkland Lang, a guy who, who, by all accounts, you have no business losing to whatsoever. You know, it's, he was written off. And so top rank... Uh, it was basically considered in the articles at this time that top rank was taking this big risk, you know, signing Roberto Duran. You know, Robert, who, what was Roberto Duran even going to do? Like they had no idea, but they signed him and they got him a fight with Pepino Cuevas, who himself was, you know, uh, by this time, not ancient, but definitely past his best. And, you know, he beat up Pepino Cuevas pretty good at the Los Angeles sports arena. But even so, in the Jimmy Batten fight and the Pepino Cuevas fight, uh, he looked unimpressive to most eyes. And people thought that he looked pudgy and looked very good. You know, he looked like he had fallen out of shape between fights every time. And even Bob Arum was like, whatever, you know, we signed him. We don't really expect that much out of him. We don't know what he's going to do. Meanwhile, Davey Moore, even despite the fact that he'd been kind of sitting on the shelf a little bit, was still a very hot commodity with top rank. Totally. So Duran wasn't even supposed to be in the picture originally. Like when Duran started his comeback, the fight that people were clamoring for and the fight that it looked like was going to take place was Davey Moore against another member of tomorrow's champions, Tony Ayala Jr. Um, Ayala, while well, Davey Moore was champion, yeah, just... You know, Ayala in the I 80s. don't even know if that's an episode I could get through, dude. I mean, that's <laughs> that's I mean, that's a whole other discussion we could have on another time, man. Because I don't yeah. know how to get through that either. That's a really, really, and considering how dark we can get with some of the stuff we talk about, that's that might be a level I'm not sure we're ready for. But regardless, not not talking about his out out of the ring antics. Um, Ayala was a very world, good fighter, very very, very good, good fighter. fighter. And a very popular one in the early 80s. And when he was coming on the scene, his popularity was even surpassing more at this point, I would say, even though Moore was champion. Like, and, and a lot of people thought he was a, the better fighter, too. Totally, totally. And he looked him, man. Like, Aiello was an absolute beast. The way he came in there, sure, he wasn't body beautiful. You know, there were still questions about his stamina and a few other things. But the way he just came in before, like, years before Tyson came on the scene and just brutalizing guys and stopping them and sometimes spinning on them in the way he wasn't, he wasn't just an out and out slugger. Like there was obvious layers of skill to his game. And you just knew you were watching a prodigy in there that like, it wasn't an if, but when he was going to be a world champion. And so when he finally rose up in the ranks and it looked like, you know, he's mandatory challenging to more or number one contender, whatever it was, um, all that, you know, a lot of people were thinking, okay, more is a good fighter. This is going to be a good fight. But like, a lot of people are thinking this is, you know, Ayala will eventually just beat him up and become champion. But unfortunately, the fight ended up not happening because Ayala had a lot of out-of-the-ring issues, like you said. And I think this was the one that um, the reason why this fight ended up not happening was because of him being a fucking idiot and raping a, raping somebody or whatever it was, right? Just showing the scumbag that he was. Was this the I, fight? That then, I think this was the – I think this was – what he did outside the ring this time, like with the issues when he like broke into the girl's apartment and raped her or whatever it was, and then he went to jail. That's why the fight ended up not happening. Yeah, to briefly, yeah, you you summed it up pretty good. That's a that he broke into this young lady's house and then sexually assaulted her, and then yeah, and then and then years he never later, even, 
he, years later, he did the exact came, same thing. Exactly. He came out of jail years later, had this whole sob story, Ring Magazine, not just Ring. I don't want to just single them out, but every publication, because it was big news. He came out, he was, you know, throwing this whole thing. I've learned I'm reformed and all that. Bought with a fucking ankle monitor on. Had his wife by his side, had his whole family back. Was First fight was back on pay-per-view. Uh, uh, we're veering off course, but you get what I'm saying. It's, Absolute yeah. scumbag is what yeah. we're saying. Yes, complete, complete from t- head to toe. And that's precisely why the fight didn't happen, or at least one of the, the well, the major reason why the fight didn't happen is because he's a fucking scumbag. Totally, totally. And so Duran comes into the picture. And like you said, Duran is on the back burner, man. No one wanted to touch Duran after he lost to Kirkland Lane again. Like, there's a very, there's a photo that um, I'm, I guess you could find it on Google or something where you see Don King in the ring with him, I think before the Lane fight where he just looks absolutely dejected. He has, you can tell King wants to be anywhere else on the planet except to be in the ring with Duran at that point. Like he's just done with him. And then Duran ends up losing that fight. And Duran, like he said, you know, and many accounts, he's also mentioned this. He wanted nothing to do. Like he wanted nothing to do with anything like, like with boxing. Like he felt dejected. He felt abandoned. Everybody on his team just like, you know, got rid of him. Ray Arcel disappeared. Freddie Brown disappeared. Um, all of his managers, whoever, everybody was gone. So they pick up the scrap heaps. Teddy Brenner, always considered the dean of matchmakers and one of the greatest matchmakers of all time, even told Aaron, look, man, I bet yeah, you... He, he was working with top rank at this time, yeah. He was, totally. And he told her, and he told Aaron, listen, man, I think Duran might still have some juice in him. He's just a guy that's really depressed. If we actually put some interest and show him that we might care, he might react to it, you know? And like you said, it was a slow build. The Jimmy Batten fight was... um. Was the was the walkout bout on um what prior Arguello wasn't it? I think so. Eleven, twelve. Yep, it had to have been. Yep. Yeah, it was the walkout bout. But that's how Duran had to come back if he was going to be humble. If he had to humble himself and do that, he had to do stuff like this. You know what I mean? And according according to them, he demanded that he wouldn't fight on the undercard, and so they put him in the walkout bout. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and and I mean, you know, uh, he looked like shit. According to pretty much everybody, he looked yeah, like shit. Yeah. He just didn't look very good as a fighter in the ring. And on top of that, you have to also kind of like remember something just a little bit more here too. Going back into the Davy Moore fight, which happened in Madison Square Garden, that was where Roberto Duran's U.S. debut took place. Madison Square Garden in yep. 1971? I guess maybe two. But yeah, 71, I think. Yes. Maybe 72, but in any case, it took a it took place in Madison Square Garden. That was where it all began. That was where his journey with, you know, uh, his US journey with Ray Arcel began. And I mean, so the this was to him considered like a homecoming. Yeah. This was to him. And he was cons- motivated for this one too. He was extremely crazy. motivated. He was pissed. He felt like he was being discarded. He felt like nobody believed that he could win this fight. Uh, except for one person. You want to know that one person who thought that Duran might win this fight? Ray Arcel. They interviewed Ray Arcel before this fight because they got in touch with him. And Ray was kind of like, yeah, this kid more looks good. But this is Roberto Duran. So, So you know, he's like, if he's got anything left, like they better watch out for this kid. And so, okay, so people don't go by the movie that has showed that Ray Arcel actually made this fight because he didn't. All right, he wasn't a matchmaker. He wasn't a promoter. He didn't go and ask for a favor for Duran to get this fight like they portrayed in the movie. All right, none of that happened. <laughs> he had nothing to do with Duran. Boxing movies, dude. Yes, I so do I. But, um, movies, bro. You know, but that's how Duran got into this shot. And as it was mentioned in Acevedo's book, like we talked about earlier, Duran was quoted after he beat Cuevas. He said something to the effect of, "You know, I'm not the Duran of old, but I know I'm better than a lot of the guys out there still today." And he might have been alluding to Mora when he was talking about it. So even, you know, Duran still fit into the mix before this too, because there was talks of Duran fighting Tony Ayala Jr. Those two hated each other, by the way. There was a fierce rivalry. Duran thought Ayala was a little punk, which he was obviously. Ayala thought Duran was old news. They were both macho. They both, you know, had similar, the whole way they were, obviously they were going to butt heads. And there was talk about that fight happening. And it almost did. But again, you know, Ayala went to jail and fuck him because he's discarded now. So Duran, very, very popular name. And they thought that Moore would still be able to beat him, but he's on a nice little run now. Let's put him in an MSG against Moore. Moore is a guy from New York too, so it's going to fill up the garden. 
But on top of this, too, this was Duran's birthday, all right? You got to fight Duran Duran, who's already adored by New York City as it is, and you're going to put yep. him in there on his birthday. Yeah, they him. underestimated that shit, too, because they showed out for Duran way more than more. And more, you know, poor guy, I don't think he realized at that point, too, psychologically before the fight, um, how much the crowd would be against him because he's fighting, like, not only is he fighting for Iran, you're fighting him on his birthday in his adopted home. Like, Moore, I think, figured because he was homegrown at NYC from the Bronx, being a multi-time Golden Gloves champion, a long, you know, for, world champion, uh, everything, his backstory, all this other stuff, yada, 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 that he'd be the hometown favorite. And don't get me wrong, like, he obviously had some support in the garden that night, but there's levels to this, man. That's like when you bring in a guy and then you fought Trinidad at the garden and then you heard the levels of noise that went on with it. Like you weren't, you know, you hear that and you get intimidated. You're like, shit, are you serious? And, you know, that, and the thing is, that was probably the least of Davey Moore's problems because before this fight, and a lot of people might not realize this, but, you know, Moore, and again, this is to allude to what she said about overconfidence and what he was thinking before the fight. Um, he actually got some dental work done. And it wasn't like he got this work done a few weeks beforehand where he might have some chances to heal up or whatever it is. No, he got this done a few days before the fight, all right? I think he was had some teeth extracted or root canal or whatever it was. But that whatever the major work was, it had, it had to get stitches put into his mouth and get you know oral surgery for it. And that type of surgery that you get, you need to take time out and like not rest and rest and not spar, let alone fight. And more Dude, didn't matter. When I got my fucking... <laughs> When I got my fucking wisdom teeth out, bro, that shit took like two months to heal. Yeah. I had and it, and it even then was kind of like, it was like kind of tender and shit too. When I had to get braces as a kid, I still had a few teeth that weren't ready to be pulled out yet. And the dentist had to pull them out, just extract them on their own. And that was the worst pain I ever went through because the, the Novocaine ended up coming out. But again, oh. like it took me forever to like recover from something like that before they were able to put braces on me and shit. So the one thing you can kind of compare this to, if you want to go back in history, is when Pancho Villa got teeth extracted, you know, right before his fight with Jimmy McLaren. Because he had like a, um, remember he had like a tooth infection or yeah, something. Yeah, he had an infected tooth, yeah. Infected, infected tooth. And then he got the teeth extracted and they were like, do not fight. Please do not fight. By God, do not fight. What are you thinking? Don't do anything like this. And he ends up fighting, gets beat up in the fight because he's like droggy from, you know, all the stuff going on. And then soon afterwards, because getting punched in the face, like they begged him not to do, like exasperated the, the shit that just went on. And he ends up dying soon after that, like literally yep. a week or so after that. And if you fast forward now to the 80s, maybe if Bia was around then, they would have found ways to like make him survive. But like we're talking, you know, different areas. But you can think of it as something similar. Moore is going in there with just freshly done dental work and a lot of fresh wounds in his mouth. And even though he thinks he's fighting an old, you know, fat, out of shape, washed up Duran, he's fighting a dude who's very motivated and who doesn't really respect him at all. And more coming in there so underprepared with the, you know, the dental work he got done. That was a recipe for disaster. Yeah, dude, even Bob Arum at the pre-fight press conference said something to the effect of anybody, basically said anybody who's picking Duran's a fucking idiot. Like anybody picking Duran is stupid as fuck. Like, you know, what you're talking about. Davey Moore was, he even, I don't know why, but he was pissed before the fight. He was all grumpy. He was like barking shit at reporters. And even he, toward the end of his interview, was talking shit, talking about no moss, you know, like, you know, yeah. Was. I mean, just about pretty much what you can imagine. He was talking shit. Um, and Moore was about a two to one favorite going into the fight uh, in some places a little bit more. Um, and I mean, dude, you know, Duran gave him an absolute fucking whooping. Uh, and oh, actually, one last pre fight point that I totally forgot to say Leon Washington supposedly protested all of the officials. He protested the, he pro protested two of the judges who were Japanese. He protested Luis Magana, who was the referee. And then uh, I could I didn't see who else, but he he said he protested all of the officials because he said he wanted at least one American official and that he wanted like a more neutral set of officials, I guess. Um, but and, you know, that sounds kind of dumb. But at the same time, after the fight, when you look back, 
at how it was officiated and how it was judged. Like maybe that motherfucker had a point, dude, because the two Japanese judges wound up scoring multiple even rounds, like an absurd amount of evil, even rounds. And the, and the referee was like a totally asleep at the wheel. It was bad, man. So not only does Mora come in with his mouth, like still fresh from dental work and being beat up, like, in the first round, he gets in there and Duran ends up, like, after, it was kind of nondescript at first, but Duran ends up thumbing him near the end of the round. And whether... It's really it, tough to see, because I've watched it, like, a few times, and I'm like, is that, it was that where it happened? Like, Well, I mean, that's what being to see. Means when you're a crafty, dirty fighter, you can get away with shit. Exactly. You know? So that's what Duran did. That was a crafty, dirty movie pull. That's you know? true. That's a good point. <laughs> When you're able, like, if you're able to see and you're like, wait, did he do that? I can't really tell. That's that's them being crafty, you know? That's a good point, yeah. All of the ones who are blatant out, out of the way are the ones who clearly don't have the craft down yet. So, <laughs> Rand was a veteran at this. But anyways, Moore's eye is just obliterated at that point. It gets really, really bad. And it doesn't, it doesn't look so bad at first. It just looks like there's, like, maybe a little bump right here at first. Yeah. But Duran just zeroed in on that bish. And, you know, as even if Duran wasn't the Rand of old, as he mentioned, he was still a great fighter and he was highly motivated for this fight, like you said. And more, we mentioned earlier, he had, the guy was offense first, defense second. So not only think about his style to begin with, as he just kind of comes in there and overpowers you and tries to overwhelm you. Now he's doing it with only one eye, an eye that's already damaged now. And a guy who, like Duran, who's so crafty on the inside the way he is, even if against bigger fighters, he just knows just the natural at it was just going to tear Moore up. And that was a style, even if Moore had two good eyes, probably the same thing was going to happen. And that's what just exactly happened, man. Duran zeroed in on it and just started beating the shit out of him, man. And that's not to say Moore didn't have his moments, man. Like, he landed some good shots in the fight, and he was very competitive. But gradually, as the rounds went on, you just saw the beating he was taking. And, like, not only was his eye becoming grotesquely swollen and disturbingly bad, like his nose was getting busted up. He was bleeding from his mouth. He was just taking a beating all around. It was just he really just looked a mess. An it absolute was a fucking mess. It was an absolute mugging. And the referee, uh, Ernesto Magana, was just sitting there. Just he's, he's like standing there. He's like, mm -hmm. absolutely stupefied by it. He's just kind of watching a massacre take place. And he's like, wow, really? Ooh, ooh, you know. And you're just kind of sitting there in each round. You're going and you're like, why? Stop it, please. This is not worth it. You yeah. know, you just see the career and life, for that matter, of Moore just being beat out of him. And it got to the point now before the end of the fight, Moore's girlfriend and mom end up passing out ringside because they're just watching something you would only see in horror films at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like, this was as bad yeah, as... Taking it. an absolute beating. And Duran is, like, relishing in this because this is the type of shit Duran loves. He loves to beat the shit out of somebody and just prolong this. So, yeah. you know... And like he's feeling the crowd, everybody's cheering for that. They're just cheering for him to kill more. Basically, Moore's face looks like um, God. If you, you watch the movie Gladiator, the one with Cuba Gooding Jr., you know what I'm talking yes. about, right? But like one of those scenes where like they're over there and the guy's being held yeah, up. What's the hardest part of the body? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you see, and they're, and they're about to like smash him. And the guy's face is just a bloody mask before he finishes him. That's how Moore was looking. And the referee's just sitting there again. And you're kind of wondering what needs to be done, man. And I think they even threw in the towel and the referee ignored it at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They were, he was, he wasn't even like looking And the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the top rank people actually had to go up and basically stop the fight because it, because Moore was just getting the absolute shit kicked out of him. And I mean, it was like the perfect, uh, it was like a perfect storm as, as far as the shit kicking dude, because there was the eye so then after that he couldn't see a lot of the shit coming but like you said style wise it was the worst thing for him because he was just going like this and locking up with duran like and you can't do that no like un unless you're marvin Hagler, you can't do that <laughs> you know, like, Hagler didn't come with him at that, with that approach Hagler yeah he didn't just like, yeah, he didn't just fight inside with him like you know Hagler wasn't dumb and so that was the thing was that Moore just kept going boom and like colliding with him and then so 
just inside, that's exactly, it's not just that that's the only place where Roberto Duran's good, but that's like his bread and butter, dude. You know, you watch the way that he hand fights on the inside and that's some Roberto Duran shit. And that's a lot, that's a really subtle kind of thing that a lot of fighters and people who watch fights who don't really seem to understand a lot of the time. And that's, you know, like you watch what he's doing with Moore's hands the entire fight and with his own hands too, because throughout the fight, he's sitting there doing this shit where he's like, you know, healing him and rubbing his gloves all over his face and, you know, forearming him and shit like that all over. Cause that's, you know, on top of it being veteran shit, but it also got to a point where he, he wasn't even trying to hide it anymore. Like after a few rounds, he wasn't trying to hide anything. He was hitting him on the hips. He was elbowing him and Magani didn't ran shit. (laughs) <laughs> Maganya didn't do shit and so I mean it's it's I kind of have two you know a split opinion about it and the first one is if you're a fighter you get away with what you're allowed to get away with but mm-hmm. at the same time my other opinion is you know just because you can doesn't mean you should and that oh. was that was shitty of Duran because he did indeed wind up more or less ruining Davy Moore's career doing that but again you know it's it's it ain't fucking tennis but the point is that he absolutely administered a beatdown to Davey Moore and did it in a pretty filthy way. And Magania didn't do a goddamn thing about it the entire time. Uh, and so for the last maybe round or two, uh, before, before catching him big, for the last round or two, Duran is just pushing him against the ropes and just beating him up just beating him up, you know, softening him up, like kind of little by little, not even little by little, like he's cracking the shit out of him. And then finally a right hand sends more to his knees and is just like, you know, this guy is getting absolutely crucified in there, man. I don't know. There were several instances during the course of the last few rounds where Magana could have stepped in. Nobody would have said anything, you know, nobody would have been like, even before that. Yeah. He, he proved his toughness. You know what I'm saying? Like that was the only thing he could do that night was prove he was durable, and that's what he did. It looked worse than Meldrick Taylor did in 12th round against so, Chavez. Yeah, it was rough, it was, dude. It was bad, man. And it's, it's hard to watch. If you're a casual fan who's just getting into boxing and you haven't really seen anything that brutal yet, when you get, when you see something like that, that's kind of like, you know, going from zero to 50. Because yeah, it's, it's one of those, this is why they hate magic. boxing it's type of things. It's a bloodletting, man. It's just, it's just really bad. They, you know, more was ruined in that fight. And the, we've talked about it before, and it's been discussed throughout boxing history that, like, there's always certain fights that some guys, they just, it, all it takes is one fight, and it's beaten out of them. That's it. They're done. You know, they're ruined. And it looked like that was, hap- that was what happened to Davey Moore. I, yeah, it is. That's kind of how Carlos Acevedo framed it, and I think that he was correct as well, that this was kind that's of... Like- how everybody's always framed it, too, man. Moore was just shell-shocked from that fight. Like, there's some things... You know, that referee let in Moore's cor- corner for it, for that matter. They just they just let it go on for so long that they just let yeah. him get so pummeled for so bad. The way it is that it just, you know, they, they, beat the, they beat the fight out of the kid. He was still young. Yeah. He still had a lot of career left in him. Well, I want to say a lot because his style wasn't going to make for a long career. But, you I mean, know. If he, if he hadn't still, taken that, though, yeah. you'd assume he'd have more. Totally, yeah, he definitely could have had some more top fights after that or something. But. To say that, you know, before we say that, there was still some promise because it looked like after that Duran fight, you know, he comes back for a couple of fights. First off, he beats Monty Oswald. You know, a guy, there's no world beater, but it's just an easy comeback fight. But his second fight in that comeback, you know, and it shows you how far, though, his, his stock has already dropped because it takes place outside of America, is when he fights Wilfred Benitez, another spent bullet at that point, by the, as we get to 1984. And... This was Moore's probably his last big win of his career. And, you know, it is a good win because Benitez by 84, people know he's past it, but he's still a commendable name. And he's still, you know, all he would need at this point was like a win or two to go back into the high rankings. So this fight was looked upon as a crossroads. Whoever loses this, this is the end of him. Whoever wins this fight, hey, the momentum will go back to our title fight again. But even this fight, man, you know, Moore had an asterisk after it because of what happened during it. To rewind just a tiny bit, so oh, after, after the eighth round TKO loss to Duran, uh, according to Leon Washington, in this part, I believe, um, he said that after the fight, he just didn't even hear from Davey Moore, or that he only heard from him a handful of times, and that when he did hear from him, that Davey Moore said he didn't want to fight anymore, that he was done fighting, uh, you know, that he fell into a depression, it sounded like. Well, he um, definitely did, definitely. 
not only it was a physical beating, mostly just everything that happened, the way the crowd turned on him, everything, oh, man, that definitely messed with him. And understandably, too, you know, undefeated, great amateur career. Exactly. And then, um, and so he, so that happened in June of 1983. Leon Washington's contract with Davey Moore was up in September. And he hadn't heard from him by August. And so Davey Moore just let the contract lapse. After that, he wound up joining forces with a dude named Howard Fingers, which is just a fucking... <laughs> change your name bro come on but howard fingers who was in the <laughs> fuck i know come on we're fucking seven years old here but this fool was an attorney and so yeah. he winds up managing davy moore and then he brings on johnny Purcell, who was an old light heavyweight contender from his de- fighter from decades before who's always showed up in great shape and was a hard hard fighter he was his trainer uh for a little while and so that was during this kind of like you know a little bit of a comeback for Davey Moore that was who was handling him so yeah like you said he fights Monty Oswald but then with Wilfred Benitez that was seen as kind of like this is the the moment where we see if he can come back you know like is Davey Moore still viable like you know what's what's going to happen with his eye what's going to and so right around this time too was when they had started uh staging a bunch of fights in Monaco like they had had a number of big glitzy. They still do it every so often. They haven't done it in a number of years. I think Golovkin fought in Monaco a couple of times, but it, man, remember them standing room only crowds? Where Golovkin used to fight. Yeah, in? it was like this weird looking ballroom where it's like this is a fight venue. What is this? But he it's like always this, hope that they were going to send me to one of those. It's this. It's very swanky looking, you know, very black tie looking and shit. So, um, but in any case, right around this time, that's when they had. Uh, you know, really gotten into staging uh, some of these bigger, especially for whatever reason, junior middleweight and middleweight fights in Monaco. Anyway, it happened. Uh, so the audience what they want, bro. <laughs> okay, let's go to Monaco. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, Wilfred Benitez, like you said, he, we could, we should do our own show about the Benitez family, but Wilfred Benitez is another fighter who was pushed hard, pushed early uh accomplished a shitload in a short period of time but then absolutely just fizzled out and burned out so quickly um you know understandably and this was at a period this was at a time where people weren't really sure what all he had left and that was also that also tied into why that why duran's lost him people were like oh fucking duran because Benitez already by that point, people were like, is Benitez shot? You know, they didn't know. And so a loss to Benitez, people were like, fucking Duran's done, dude. That's why this whole thing got so complicated and weird. So Wilfred Benitez, they're like, all right, well, you know, obviously Benitez is still somewhat viable because he can beat, uh, you know, this Roberto Duran in this state. So let's see what happens here with, with Davey Moore and blah, blah, blah. And they get in there. And so, I mean, you can tell too, i think benitez didn't benitez, like benitez had moved to middleweight and he was they were like trying to they were trying to position him for a fight with Hagler after he lost after benitez lost to hearns and then benitez got mauled and mugged by um uh, ham show yeah that was the one and that's where people were just like oh well maybe he's not as you know maybe he is kind of past it so i wish that just wouldn't have happened even if we could have just gotten could have completed the four kings circle and and, and if gotten, gotten, gotten the full five the kings in like four rounds or whatever we we were almost there yeah. gotten we, the full five kings experience you know almost there we were so close thanks a lot ham show damn it <laughs> bastard now it's it it was it was really difficult to tell i think at this point what exactly benitez had left but it was clear to a lot of people that it probably wasn't like a lot you know and and on top of that, he did a lot of messing around outside of the ring. He did a lot of like, you know, just fucking around. And that was part of the reason why his dad came down so hard on him and his brothers too. But they I mean, it's out of the magazine saying you're going to lose his upcoming fight to Shivering Flair. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, no shit. I mean, yeah, that entire, that entire thing was just toxic. You know what I mean? Like him, his misbehavior feeding his dad's fucking vicarious shit and his dad's vicarious shit feeding the misbehavior. It was... It's toxic. But anyway, so back to Davey Moore, 
this it was there were a lot of kind of crossroads questions going into this fight which i in my opinion feel like were answered like extremely early in the fight where benitez looks like listless dude he his defense it, at least he got caught cold or something because he's just sitting there looking at him like he's just sitting there fucking looking at him early on in the fight like he he wasn't even in a fight he and was then, busted at that point all he had was like his reflexes were still dulled but he still had them because yeah, it was just instinct, like, yeah, pure yeah. instinct. Totally. And more, even though he got thrashed by Duran, he was kind of, you know, a spent bullet himself. He wasn't as spent as Benitez was. Yeah, that. it was like, just don't hit his eye and he'll be okay. Yeah, exactly. And so Mora hits Benitez with a right hand in the first round. Like Benitez, you know, like you said, he wasn't doing much. And Mora ends up catching him. But when Benitez goes down, he gets up and he has a, uh, noticeably he could see he's like wobbling you know what i mean like you know he has a definite limp to himself but he's trying to like play it off and trying to like fight it but you can see that something definitely happened to his ankle like something happened to his foot like he's yeah. kind of almost like, like he's trying to shake his foot out or you know something totally, but it's totally, like oh shit but like it's not really working he's this ain't gonna shake out and his mind is going you can see his mind is going a thousand miles a minute they're trying to figure out what's going on but realizing that he still has to fight this and then the most remarkable thing you will ever see, like Laura drops him and tries to go after him. And Benitez, because he's still wobbling on one foot, it hasn't gone away. He just goes huddling into a corner, which is a safe spot. You saw him do this against Duran. You saw them do this against countless guys in the past. And he goes there and he does, just on instinct, even though he's past his prime, the most remarkable shit you will ever see. Just with his hands down, basically. Just exactly, man. Just like a video game. Just And Davey Moore... God bless him, misses like 45 or 50 punches in a row. And he's standing right there where that should not happen. You know what I mean? Like, it's like playing a video game. You see more throwing, 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 boom, 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 boom. He's throwing uppercuts. He's throwing everything. And Benitez is slipping every single one of them. And then you find out afterwards because the fight ends up getting stopped in two rounds because Benitez can't go on with his foot. And then you find out afterwards, Benitez did that on a broken ankle. Yeah, a literal broken, broken ankle. A literal broken ankle. He made Davy Moore miss with 40 for the 45 punches in a row. Like, you remember, I, you, you're you one of the few people who I could just randomly ask if you remember this, and you probably will remember this. But remember okay. Pollo Valenzuela and Tacumbo Elijah Day? Tacumbo, yeah, okay. Remember Pollo Juan Valenzuela caught him with a, yeah, like a yeah, wild yeah. shot, and he went down. Elijah Day went down and broke his ankle. And he that's kept right, trying to get right. up yeah, yeah, and his, yeah, his totally, foot totally. was like dragging on the ground and shit. And like, they were like, oh my God. Well, Benitez got up. Benitez Michael rose Grant. and Michael tried Grant to fight back. To, um, uh, the, the other heavyweight there. Goofy Derek Whitaker. Jefferson, Derek Jefferson. Remember he broke his ankle when he lost to um, Oleg Maskaev. Who was it that did it against Jamil McCline? Was it Whitaker? Oh, that was Michael Grant. No, it was Michael Grant. Okay, so I was close. Goofy Whitaker, Michael Grant. You know, yeah, one. yeah, 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 totally. But, <laughs> but, and, and so think about, like, exactly, man. It's crazy shit when that happens. And Benitez was able to, just in the corner, on one leg, because you can see, like, he's visibly trying, you know, leaning on his other leg. And he makes, and he makes um, Davey Moore miss with all those punches. And it's like, whew, you know. So that, that shows you the genius of Benitez. Benitez might be one that, you know, I don't know if he's the greatest defensive fighter in history, but if he's not, he's in the top three or five for me. He's like, definitely he's, among them. For I sure. mean, like, he would even make a guy like Mayweather look bad. You know what I mean, I'm sure all the Mayweather hate and like lovers out there would not appreciate hearing that. But like Benitez, there's not a fighter out there that Benitez, is, and unless it was, you know, at the very end, tail end of his career, that he didn't make look like shit at some point. One of the few, like, dude, all, pretty much nobody. Over the course of his career, pretty much nobody outboxed Tommy Hearns. Yeah. And there were some rounds where Benitez would outbox him. No. Totally. And there's that part, too, where Benitez is on the ropes, which is like death against Tommy Hearns. And you see Hearns just winging, like, the shots that he was throwing, the uppercuts, the right hands, the hooks. And Benitez, the same thing, just the duck and the duck and the weave and the whole thing, man. Like, what a fucking marvel he was, man. Beautiful to watch, but... Anyways, that was Moore's last big win. And obviously, Moore was feeling high off of that one because that is a big win. You know, you end up stopping Benitez. And that was the fight that everyone's like, oh, geez, Benitez is completely finished. Well, okay, we're talking now. Um, this was 1984. You know, and Moore was thinking for himself that he was looking ahead to a potential, either not, if not winning the junior midway crown, eventually fighting Hagler again. Like, that's, that, was the, that was the talk that he was having after that fight. Like, he was, you know, in high hopes, but... 
immediately after that fight, he ends up fighting Luis Acres. And that was another fight that used to be on YouTube years ago, but uh, it's not on anymore. And more, and again, more looked listless in that fight. Like it was, you can clearly see he wasn't the same fighter anymore. Acres is a part of the, the promotional brothers, right? That, that put on a lot of fights. Mm -hmm. Yeah from the nineties and stuff, you might remember them, but, um, Bruno, I, I want to say, and yeah. And different guys, but like, you know, more kind of got shafted in that one, the whole disqualification thing going on there. The fact that you, again, to show you how far his stock had dropped, he was brought in as an opponent to France for that fight. You know what I mean? So. Well, and, and he lost and he winds up losing by DQ. That's why I said it was kind of a shot. So DQ from what I remember, it wasn't something like if you watch it, you'd be like, ah, man, there was definitely some home cooking more got fucked on that one. The, yeah, and I mean, that's not it's something that we've seen a handful of times in some in some places. Like, I mean, I'm not trying to just be stereotypical here, but like we've seen that shit in Italy. We've seen a lot of home cooking type shit in Italy, seen some shit in France and just some of these countries where like we don't see a shitload of world class boxing. And like, you know, every so often it goes there and it's like, whoa, some crazy shit going on here. And that's kind of what, what that bout wound up being. But like, you know, and again, um, so, well, so once more, uh, Davey Moore winds up having to kind of like retool and he takes time off. He took uh, a really significant amount of time off, almost two or a little over two years, actually. And then when he had come back, let me pull up my notes here. When he had come back, he had actually hooked up with, this is a name that actually Believe it or not, it's not on the internet that much, despite the fact that the guy was an Olympian. Who's that? His name was Abel Abel. Okay. Abel, A-B-L-E, Abel, A-B-E-L. He is an ex-Olympian. It was a, it was a track. Fast. What's that? So save that, say that five times fast. It's a, it's a doozy. He was an Olympian and he was like a uh, in track and it, and he was in his nineties around this time too. So he was an old dude. And this is who in New Jersey, Davey Moore who had apparently hooked up with as a trainer. I don't know who was his manager at this time, but he wound up making kind of one last like push or whatever as a pro fighter. And mm -hmm. he'd come back in 1986, except for, you know, things had changed considerably because by the time he had come back, he was basically slumming it. He, there was no, uh, the opportunities for him to be like kind of a main, an A-lister or a main eventer or whatever on that level had clearly uh -huh. tanked uh -huh. because he was, he was brought in, in like, you know, the Caesars hotel and casino in Atlantic city. I'm sure not a tiny venue, but nonetheless, not a massive or mainstream one, even in Atlantic City at that time, I don't think. And then, you know, from there, pretty much every fight, every subsequent fight from there, he was either brought in to lose or brought in as the opponent or fought in some far flung fucking weird place. And it's, and it's fascinating, too, because in as um, well, was quoted in Acevedo's book more again you know he was like incredulous to this he couldn't believe it and and i can understand that you know what i mean i'm sympathetic to something like that imagine at one point because you said you're fast-tracked like leon spanks was and others you're fast-tracked everybody, everybody loves you everybody's your friend you. and after 10 pro fights you're on top of the world which and back then in the early 80s like we said was like unfathomable at that point and so you're going from purses you make it high six figures to even making probably a million or so for fighting duran and now you're fighting for fifteen thousand dollars, and that's what and that's what kind of what Moore said too. He was like, "You mean now I go from the purses I was making, now I'm making fifteen thousand dollars? That's what I'm worth now? Are you serious? Like, it it, yes. it was hard for him to comprehend. Yes, he, you he, are, sir. Yeah, you know, and that's the that's the and the reality was that he might have been lucky to get in that. Boxing. Totally, yeah. totally. But that's the brutal reality of boxing at that point too. You know what I mean? Once you're not worth anything and you're not viable. You're just, you know, another bump in the road that people are going to build their record on. You're just a name. And even being a name doesn't mean you're going to make money off of that. You're just a name now for people to use. Doesn't mean you're going to make money from that name, you know? And yeah. Moore, I think, didn't understand that he was now just being used as a name as opposed to being someone that was like a name that was going to make money. He was just, no, he was just a name to add to people's records. But, you know, he still had a couple of like high profile fights, but unfortunately they weren't, you know, successful ones. As you said, he made a comeback. He has one fight against, you know, a nondescript opponent. But then he moves then that to fight Buster Drayton, who we've mentioned on past, um, excuse me, past uh, shows before. 
Buster Drayton, a guy, if you look at his record, didn't look like much at that point. Another person that fought, though, everybody and anybody. And even though he didn't have the best record, it was a respectable record considering a good fighter, but not a top fighter. But he was able to win a world title. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, he was still able, you know, he he scored a big upset. And um, as champion, you know, he kind of came into his own. One of those guys that like, even with a shitty, I wouldn't say shitty because his record wasn't shitty, but like even with a record that was a little spotty, when they become world champion, that's when they really start hitting their stride. And after they lose the title, they kind of go back to being what they were beforehand. But Drayton yeah, yeah. was one of those, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And Drayton was one of those guys, and he was already tough as nails to begin with, and he was at his peak at this point. And um, Moore was clearly on the back nine. And to show you, too, like, you know, how far Moore had dropped, this fight was even held in America. This was one of those IBF title fights that was held in, you know, somewhere in Europe. And no one really gave it much attention, and Moore got beat up in it. He ended up getting stopped. And still he felt delusional because he thought to himself, you know, this is at this point when you end up losing fights like this, you're just kind of like, oh, man, you know, I didn't have that much training to do. And I just only had one comeback fight. If I get a little bit more, I'll be back on top again because he was still young. He still thought of himself as being the best. You know what I mean? But it, it wasn't to be again. He ends up fighting another, you know, nondescript opponent in Cecil Pettigrew. And then he comes in, like you said, we mentioned him as an opponent. He comes in as a last minute replacement now for Dwayne Thomas, for which was supposed to be a title fight against an absolute bruiser in Lupe Aquino. The only thing now for Moore, which makes this really viable for him, is that this is on the undercard of Sugar Ray and London, Marvelous Marvin Hagler. So a lot of eyes will be watching on this. It also made for an incredible backdrop, because you know how much I love those outdoor Caesar shows. <laughs> and, and on top of that, the fucking irony in the fact that just a few years earlier, he was talking about how they were aiming for a shot at Ray Leonard, when yeah. now here they are a couple years later, as a last the, replacement fighting on the very on the first fight on the as a replacement game. on the undercard of their fight of a Ray, a Ray Leonard who had retired several times by then totally. so it's like it's already like he's you know Davey Moore has lived you know these other lives yes. while these other yeah. fighters have done other things you know it's totally. Totally. just the the supreme irony of that shit and he loses a t by TKO to Lupe Aquino on the undercard of of uh, Leonard Hagler, and then well, just a couple. That, man. It, it was. I don't, don't mean to like to elaborate, but like yeah. to, to to break it down, man. I watched it right before the show started. Like I've seen it before, but uh, there was a cleaner copy that was put up not too long ago. So I watched that, and like more, dude. He he's so just like for a style the way he did, man. It just wasn't gonna last for long. But it's so sad to see how like slowed down he was. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the, the mind is still there. He's still churning and throwing punches. He lands a few good punches against Aquino, but Aquino just kind of did what he wanted. Him. Like I said, Aquino was a bruiser, kind of in the body mold of a Fernando Vargas. Not the same style, but just a, a really, really tough dude. And I think it was like round three or so, you see him just unleash a flurry of body punches and head punches on more of that just like, it looks like he's beating a heavy bag, you know, just boom, 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 boom. And like more just visibly backs up. And by round five, Moore's eye again, same thing. He's always yeah, had he eye. has he has this trouble several times after the Durand fight with his eye. His eye just swells into a grotesque, nasty welt that there's you can't see completely. You can't see out of it. And uh Flip Omansky checks out during the middle of the fifth round and stops the fight. He was like, you know, you're already getting your ass kicked, like there's no point in letting this go on. But it's very telling again, it's the it's both fight is the post-fight interview, and it's telling. Moore's answers to the questions where he's really disgusted by the fight being stopped, understandably, but it's what he says too that shows me, uh, shows again that he doesn't understand that like the time has passed and he still thinks of himself because he goes, listen, I'm a world-class fighter. He says over and over, I'm a world-class fighter. I'm a world-class fighter. They should have let me continue and I would have beat this kid. All I needed was a few more rounds. All right, I was just getting into it. I could still see. Why didn't the doctor ask me to ask him, at, answer any questions? I could have seen some, you know, I could have answered some numbers. And then he said, again, I'm a world-class fighter. I'm a former world champion, yada, yada, yada. I, you know, they should have let me continue. And it's like, oh, man, you know, like, it's a person that still doesn't seem that everything is like. It's already fallen apart, dude. Totally. Like, you know, it's it's yeah. not falling apart. It has it fell apart a couple of years ago. Totally. And, and he's locked in this delusion. And even so moves forward and a couple months later loses a decision to a young and undefeated John David Jackson, who was, you know, a, a good technician, a very good technician as a fighter. But in, 
I mean, I, you couldn't even say it's not the kind of fighter Davey Moore would lose to. I mean, he could potentially lose to a John David Jackson earlier in his career. J- Jackson was a good, good fighter, but it was clear by this point that he was not being brought in to win at all. You it know, wasn't he, a close fight either, man. Jackson, no. I'm sure, boxed circles around him. I've never watched it, but yeah. And soon after that, Jackson would end up fighting Lupe Aquino and whooping his ass for, you know, rolling the early, early, early WBO belts before he went on to have a distinguished career in the 90s and um, a distinguished career as a trainer. But like you said, man, at this point, it's it's over. You know what I mean? Like the There's just four. one last push. Just one last push as a pro. And that's that was it. One last, you know, I guess, attempt. Uh, in 1988 both of those fights too, again like both of those fights took place in just you know the back ends of somewhere in new jersey the metal ends sheridan and east rutherford rutherford and some place where it doesn't even say the venue in it's staten island hour. yeah and he winds up winning uh two tkos over very nondescript opponents you know guys who were not going to really go on and accomplish anything and that's you know over the course of about six weeks he gets these two wins and i mean on the surface it's an ex, you know, an ex champion getting a couple wins, obviously gearing up for this push at a title or whatever. And it's the late eighties. There's another kind of surge in boxing and interest in boxing with Mike Tyson and whatnot, you know, uh, helping to kind of propel boxing through this post Ali era. It's yes. pretty tough. Um, and so in any case, here we are in 1988 and Davey Moore gets these two wins, except for, There'd be no wins after that. Uh, man, his uh, life, besides his career, his life, unfortunately, take a tragic turn after this. You know, we've talked so many times about fighters <clears throat> who've been shot, who've been left for dead, found dead, you know, in weird fights and struggles and all sorts of things. And I mean, this is just, it's, there's no like real like violence to it like that, or there's no like trouble. You know what I'm saying? Like just during odd. this really entire, odd. but this entire thing, we're not talking about gangs. We're not talking about drugs. We're not talking about him repeatedly getting arrested. We're not talking about any sort of trouble. And on top of that, you know, people had repeatedly said, you know, this is a guy who, especially given where he came from and the environment, you know, he stayed out of trouble. He went out of his oh, way to stay really, out of trouble. Totally. It and was so, very commendable for that, man. Everybody respected the shit out of him for that. And he was a very articulate guy, like an honor roll and just a smart overall. He had options outside of boxing. To, to have and to be repaid for that perseverance, for yes. that kind of character and for those balls to get yourself through life alone too more or less because yes, you had yes. no active parent doing holding your hand through it totally and to get repaid by roberto duran by just an absolute fucking you know awful terrible beating it's like you can't imagine psychologically how what that would crush inside of you if apart from physically yes. and then on and then on top of that you know you go through this post Duran phase where you just get beat up more and humiliated more. And so here you are at the end of your career, which was short and abrupt and, you know, shown bright. He's in, he's at this point has moved to New Jersey because this guy, Abel Abel, who was training him was from New Jersey. And at this time, Davey Moore was living in New Jersey with his wife and I believe a child. And he owned a, I couldn't even remember the name of the car because it was something that like, you know, came out for like a year or two. What's that? It was a Jeep though, right? It was a Dodge Raider. Okay. A Dodge Raider, which looks like a Jeep. It looks like a Land Rover. Like looks almost exactly like a, like something like a Land Rover. I ain't no car expert, so that makes sense. Okay. Me neither, but I did read the newspaper. (laughs) Uh, So in early June, 1988, a couple months after his last fight, his Dodge Raider was in his driveway unoccupied and for some reason started rolling down his driveway. Mm. Why? Who knows? Somebody push it. God only knows. He He ran to try to stop it. Anybody who has ever tried to stop a rolling car 
I mean, hopefully if you lived to tell about it, you know, you're not stopping a rolling car. That's 2000 pounds of something rolling, you know, like unless you have like the momentum, you're not stopping it. And so he tried to stop it, tripped or slipped, got sucked under the car somehow or into the car or between the car and something else because there wasn't a whole lot of detail, which is almost kind of like, thank goodness there wasn't, but he got smushed by the car to the point where the car pinned his chest and he asphyxiated. He couldn't breathe. So he choked to death from the car being on top of him. So it's like, oh my God. Anyway, it doesn't really get a whole lot more sad than that in terms of just, there's no rhyme here, dude. Like there's no karma. He didn't do anything. He didn't. Bad luck. Yeah, like as far as anything we can tell, he didn't hurt anybody. No, it's literally just bad luck. And like the, the end it for things to end the way they did like that too. It's like, you know, I've tried to find info on that. When I first read about that as a kid about how he died, and I thought that was like I never heard of that before, too. I was like, how does a car just roll out of its own? And you know, and I've heard stories too that it might have been raining or something or whatever it may have been, but like well, remember what it was about two, three years ago? That actor, I think his name was Anton Yelchin. Okay. The dude from Star Trek, he was in Star Trek and a handful of other movies, the recent Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, the it, almost exact same thing happened to him, except for it was like one of those, I think it was like those brick pillars that like hold the mailbox. Oh, okay. And okay. the car. Like he got caught in between those and got like crushed. Oh, God. Yeah, man. So, I mean, I'm not saying that, oh, it's common. It happens. but It's super uncommon, but it's like. It's just a crazy death, though. No, it really is. It's just something that's it's random. It's obviously extremely rare, and just I, I hate to say it, but almost adds to his bad luck because, like, what the fuck? You know that's I mean? the point. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Is that yeah? It just makes he's cursed. I, it, it it's really bad because, like, you you know, it's like really like how you know you're going out there and then you see that happening and i i don't know what his mind frame would be because i'm not sure if i would try to stop a car like that but like you know it's it's crazy to think but then like not only that because you just said it's not like something like you had an instantaneous death where he just rolled over and he was able to you know no pain like no he got asphyxiated this shit was sitting on him for a minute he had to go through god knows what kind of trauma before it was done and the poor people you know his girlfriend or wife that was next to him and that had to witness this and they couldn't do anything because they're helpless. What are you going to do? Push a car off of a person? Like, you know. And as if that were, I wish that were the end of the story. Of course I wish it were. <laughs> so, but there's two more parts to it. The first part was that Leon Washington actually trained Iran Barkley too earlier in his career. And Iran Barkley was a training partner with Davey Moore and, you know, more or less best friends with him for a number of years um, and they were very close. So the this happened, I believe it was the day before Iran Barkley's first fight with Thomas Hearns. And so Iran Barkley's team sat around debating for like a day, whether or not they were even gonna tell him. Cause they were like, this is gonna be, it's, we can't even tell him, like we gotta keep it from him. But then, it wound up making the the news, of course, made the rounds. And I believe it was um, Dennis Andres who called Iran Barkley and was in tears, but his team intercepted the call. And so they all tried to figure out what are we going to do? And they said, well, we have to tell him now because he's going to find out on the street and he's going to find out when we're not there. And then, then that will be real bad. So we're just going to have to tell him. So they told him. And Iran Barkley, they said, was crushed. They said he he cried for most of the day before the fight, and that he, that they like you know was basically inconsolable. But then at some point, basically just kind of bucked up, you know, bit his lip and said, "Then I'm gonna have to whoop Tommy Hearn's ass for Davy Moore." And so uh, that's what happened. I mean, you know, Tommy Hearn's almost got him. Tommy Hearns almost killed that story entirely. It's still one of the most but... dramatic moments ever, bro, because Barkley threw one of those punches from the South Bronx that somehow landed in but that dramatic way Hearns crashed. Whoa, you know? And to see that Barkley was double over and painful from Hearns' body shots beforehand, it was about to get stopped. 
right before he landed that shot. Oh man, you know, you can't ask for a better tribute to his fallen friend. Yeah. Tommy just, he, he made the mistake of going after him when he was hurt, you know, <laughs> it was, and if he had not, if he had just been a little more patient or gone back to the body or something, you know, who knows? History nah, that right hand knocked him from Vegas back to Detroit. He had no idea where he was at. Yeah. But he was, whoop, you know, legs went, went entirely. And, but the, uh, that adds to the kind of, you know, the poignant story. So afterward, uh, Iran Barkley gets the stoppage. He's elated and then just absolutely loses it at the post fight fight press conference to the point where he's like, you know, reporters everywhere. And he's like, puts his head down on the table and just starts like weeping. And yeah. people are like having to console him from 20 feet away. Champ, stay up champ, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, pulls himself together, but then just kind of talks about Davey Moore. So that was obviously, you know, it was super sad because Iran Barkley's having to contend with the loss of his friend, despite the fact that he has this massive victory, you know, the biggest victory of his life. And uh, so the second part of this was that with days, absolute, you know, days after Davey Moore has died, uh, a new lawsuit is filed by, I believe, his girlfriend trying to take over his estate from his mom and wife and it's like literally it was like two three days after he died and so it kind of like there was a some newspaper blurbs about it but even in the newspaper blurbs they're like we don't even know what they're going after because he has no money there was no insurance like he didn't have insurance uh i believe that they a, a number of people wound up having to pull money together to pay for the funeral uh, there were hundreds of people who showed up to the funeral, including a shitload of fighters because he was very, very well connected in the New York fighting community, you know, but nonetheless, it's like, it's funny because I said it to you before I even read the Mike Katz article, I was like, bro, it sounds like they had some massive legal fight after he died, man. He didn't even have peace and death. And then I go to read the Mike Katz article in like three sentences and Davey Moore had no peace and death. And I was like, yeah. Fucking my cats, dude. God damn my cats. You know, stole my shit. I like, bro, great minds think alike. <laughs> yeah, great cynical, fucking grumpy minds think alike. At least no. you don't have a neck. Well, I mean, you got the beard, but at least you don't have the neck brace and uh, you know the cane and just being yeah. over. I, I've <laughs> beaten them in height by like a, a foot or two. Yeah, but yeah. uh little Yoda guy. But no, um, you know, but he did nail it though, because it's just like like you just you you just said it adds to like the bad luck it like nothing happened he didn't do anything why was this so fucked up he deserved so much better he really did he from being used as a pawn for for from as bob you know with bob aram being sent to south africa and he ends up you know winning that and like you know being shot to start him probably way before he was ready for any of that to just being absolutely abused by Roberto Duran and no one trying to save him in that fight to at least prolong anything and being not only physically, but emotionally ruined after that fight, like mentally. And um, just the circumstances that happened post Duran, it's just, it's really tragic. You know what I mean? But Davey Mora was a bright light, bro. Like, you know, that's the reason why we're doing a show like this, man. Like he's a guy that's been forgotten more or less, but like for a time period, he brought a lot of excitement to the New York City boxing scene and a lot of excitement in boxing in general because he had a great style, a fun style, a great personality. I said with a smile and good looks and everything like that. And if it wasn't for that Duran fight, he probably would have had a good career going on with some bigger fights after that too. Like, you know, yeah, it's, just, it's just unfortunate how things play out. You can't you can't predict these type of things. But um, you know, we, we're here to make sure guys like Mora are forgotten, forgotten, forgotten. So that's why we're doing something. That's why we did a show like this, you know, regardless yeah. of how tragic it ended up turning out, you know, people just need to remember that name. 100% dude. Just like any, uh, a number of these fighters that we've spoken about, of course, Davey Moore is far less obscure than uh, Charles Newell. Yes. Or, uh, you know, yes. we've, we've spoken about a number of fighters that people would be like, who, you know, but nonetheless, uh, despite the fact that he was a world title holder, you know, he's like, you opened up saying, you've summed it up at the beginning, like really well, dude. He's mostly remembered for absolutely taking a beating, 
uh, by Roberto Duran, but as a person, as a fighter, he was a lot more and he deserved a better fate than what he got, which is what we wind up saying about so many fighters, too many fighters. So at the very least, you know, it, it, I wish we could do more, but at the very least, one of the least things we could do is just remember and to pass along. Yeah, we we job doing that today. At least I hope we did. I hope we did too. Hopefully people enjoyed it. Cause I know I enjoy, I always enjoy telling the stories with you. And if you want to but, remember you know, someone like him, you know, if you want to remember him, don't remember him. I like his face just being absolutely mangled by Duran. Look at that KO magazine cover that he was on the big smile that he had. That's a person right there who was young and thought the future was ahead of him. And just, you know, unfortunately I had no idea what was to come, but like at that point, you know, it, it looked like the future was, was bright. You know what I mean? And Davey Moore was a fascinating character. And I'm glad we got to cover it today. So me too. Dude. I, I appreciate you doing your due diligence and you doing your research and homework and whatnot. Cause we, we know we show up ready to go. We show up ready to rock, you know, <laughs> for sure. And, and if there's that, you know, and one other thing, if, you know, for our listeners, if there's any other like subject y'all want, you know, curious for us to cover anything, uh, shoot us on Twitter, whatever it is, I'm sure we'll get to it. Yeah, please do. I mean, like we're, we're always we try to be responsive you know when we can about about all that type of stuff and if there are good good ideas like there have been a whole bunch of times where people have suggested stuff and we've done it so yeah hell yeah man for sure hey Aris, dude, i appreciate it dude I, I appreciate you uh doing the work and everybody thank you so much for listening in if you listen in by in one of the podcast apps that we got going apple podcast google whatever it might up being please subscribe give us a rating helpful if you watched on YouTube, thank you. Very much appreciated. Go ahead and subscribe. Leave us a reply, comment. Also helpful. The Knuckles and Gloves podcast is on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram, but also on Twitter. And then individually, Eris and I are also both on Twitter. Eris is on Twitter as Punch Zone Eris. I, Patrick Connor, am on Twitter as Patrick M. Connor. Check us out there and we'll talk to you there, Eris. Talk soon, my friend. Have a good one, everyone.